Okay, so welcome everybody to introduction for introduction to Conda for data scientists. Uh, so today we're going to cover everything about Conda, um, everything you might want to know about Conda, so that you can manage your own uh, software stacks for your uh, data science or your scientific computing projects on your laptop or your workstation. Um, all these techniques are also useful on Ibex and uh, and even Shaheen to some extent. Uh, so hopefully you guys will get a lot out of out of this workshop that will improve your ability to manage your uh, data science and scientific computing projects going forward. Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen now, and then I'm going to start passing around um, some links for today's uh, for today's workshop. Okay, so the first uh, the first link that I want to share is the link to the workshop series repository on GitHub. So I'm going to put this link into the chat. OK. So when you click on that link, uh, it'll take you, obviously, to this, uh, this GitHub page here. And this is where all of the course materials for the entire workshop series go. So everything that I'm going to use for teaching the whole semester is basically here. Um, you can always come back here um, and refer to any of the any of the materials. Um, OK, so somebody can't hear me. So let's try this again. So we're going to test the, uh, test the audio. And let me just make sure everybody can hear me. OK. So, uh, Sutaza, it might be on your end, because I think everybody else can hear me and see me just fine. OK. So back to, uh, back to what I was saying. Just get out of that. OK. So I sent the link around to the GitHub repository. Now, on the GitHub repository, we have links uh, to, I'm sorry, I'll send around one more link. So I'll also resend the link to the, counts, the course webpage. So this also went out in the, um, the calendar invite. So you should also have it via email. Um, this is the, the course webpage for today. It has all the logistics and the schedule and the syllabus and things like that. OK, um, including a link to the, the course materials, uh, which I will copy and also just paste into the chat for reference. Um, and right, OK. So back on the, uh, the course uh, repo on GitHub, so I mentioned there's going to be some hands-on portions to today's, uh, today's teaching. And um, those hands-on portions are going to be done uh, within JupyterLab. So we have two, uh, two options, basically, for getting access to JupyterLab for today. The first is the Calst Binder Hub. So if you are a, uh, if you're a Calst um, uh, you know, students or staff or faculty member, or basically you're here on the CALS campus, then you should be able to click on this launch CALS Binder Hub button. So I will kind of right click and open in a new tab. And then after a, you know, a minute or so, uh, you should see JupyterLab running in your browser um, on top of the research, uh, the IT research computing's uh, new Kubernetes cluster that they were advertising uh, maybe last week. So it just takes a, a couple minutes to kind of start up. But once it starts up, so again, the link to the GitHub page I'll put back in the chat. You know, for those of you who are looking for links, please refer to the, the Zoom chat. I'm putting all the links there.
It might be taking a little bit longer to load because there might have been many people who clicked that button at the same time. Um, alternatively, there's also the public Jupyter Lab, which you can launch by clicking on the public Jupyter Lab button. Okay, so now the Calst uh, Binder Hub uh, has finished loading, and so we have Jupyter Lab. So this is what it looks like if it's running. Uh, if you're using the Calst, uh, the Calst Binder Hub, and eventually you should get the same thing on top of Google uh, Google Cloud Platform um, if you click on the public Binder Hub. So I will close out of that. <clears throat> and then I'll also paste. OK, so if you could go to the participants menu on the Zoom chat and just kind of um, check yes if you were able to get Jupyter Lab to launch for you in your browser. It doesn't matter whether you're running on the Calc Binder Hub or the public uh, the public binder hub. Um, and then if you could check no, if you have not been able to get um, either of those running. And please don't check no if you're still waiting for it to load, because it might take a couple of minutes to load. OK, so I'm seeing lots of yeses. This is good. And we're not seeing any no's. This is also good. So I have one no in the chat. So So I've put the link to the Calst Binder Hub in the chat. And I'll also put the link to the, uh, the binder, the public binder hub uh, in the chat, just in case you're having trouble finding the, the course web page. OK. OK, great. So I'm not seeing any, any no's. And hopefully, the links in the chat will sort out um, anybody who's having trouble. And if you are, there are a few people who are joining us from outside of Calus today. So if you're outside of Calus, you will need to use the public Jupyter Lab. So that's this button here, uh, or the second link that I put in the chat. Um, uh, you won't be able to access the, the, Calus, uh, the Calus Binder Hub. OK, cool. So that should sort us with the, uh, the interactive uh, set up for today. Now, these, uh, these sessions that are running, um, uh, that are, are running in the cloud, um, they will time out after a certain amount of time, particularly the public binder, uh, the public uh, binder hub. So just you want to make sure that, you know, um, as you're listening to me kind of talk and explain how to how to do things that, um, you know, keep typing a few things into, uh, you know, into the terminal in a minute, or just keep Keep your um, your window active. Uh, that way, it won't uh, kind of shut itself down. But if it does, if you do happen to kind of lose the connection, if it shuts down, you just go back and click the link, and it will start up again. Okay, cool. So the last thing that I wanted to pass around is the link to the um, the Gitter channel that I have created. So Gitter is an open source alternative to Slack. Um, basically functions in the in the same way. Uh, so I'm going to put that link into the chat. And you will need a GitHub uh, account to participate in this uh, in this kind of chat room. Um, but once you uh, once if you have a GitHub account or if you want to go ahead and sign up for GitHub, um, then you can also add your questions about uh, how to do things with Conda. Uh, here in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer them either during this workshop or after the workshop. 
I'm trying to um, use this Gitter forum as a way to capture kind of Q&A that goes on at all of the workshops that I teach in a way that it will be a, a resource for, um, for future versions of this, uh, of this training. Okay. So at this point, um, we'll hop in with the, with the actual teaching. So I'm going to put the course materials link into the chat. Okay. So here are the, uh, the course materials. So these are course materials uh, for Introduction to Conda for Data Scientists. I've been developing these uh, course materials for about um, uh, almost a year now um, in conjunction with the, uh, the Carpentries Incubator, which is um, uh, a program for um, kind of incubating uh, open source lessons, uh, materials for kind of foundational topics in uh, data science and scientific computing. Um, so, these, these uh, course materials are online, uh, they're freely available. You can use them, and refer back to them, share the link, whatever you want to do. Um, so what we're gonna cover today is, uh, there's about five episodes that I hope to cover today. Uh, the first is, is pretty quick, it's just the basics of what is Conda, kind of getting started with Conda and why you kind of motivate the problems that Conda solves for data scientists and scientific computing uh, workflows. And then we're going to talk about working with environments and sharing environments. So these two episodes are the bulk of the um, of what you would use uh, Conda to do on a day in day out basis as part of your workflow. Um, and then we'll probably skip the fourth episode and go to the fifth episode on managing GPU dependencies. Um, I, one of the major um, features of Conda that differentiates it from other environment and package uh, management managers is that it allows you to manage uh, things like your NVIDIA CUDA dependencies, including your uh, compiler, uh, the NVIDIA CUDA compiler, which makes it really powerful for uh, data science in particular, because you have a lot of GPU accelerated libraries that, um, that depend on these lower level CUDA libraries. And using Conda, you can avoid having to depend on a system installation that uh, might require root uh, permissions or things that you, that you don't have, or other things that you don't have. Okay, so that's gonna kind of round out the day. We're gonna take a, a break um, about, halfway in between, um, and we'll just see how we get on. Okay, so without further ado, I'm just gonna hop right into getting started with Conda. So the purpose of this, this uh, short introductory episode is to kind of explain what Conda is, to um, motivate the package and environment management problems that uh, you face when you're doing data science work or scientific computing work um, and kind of motivate why you should use a tool like Conda to solve those problems. Um, so by the end of this episode, hopefully you'll have some idea of what these two problems are and why they're different and why they're important and then understand basically how you can use um, Conda to kind of solve these problems. Okay. So what is Conda? So Conda is uh, an open source package and environment management system. So it's cross-platform. It runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So this is, that's super important. It's going to allow you to install, run, update packages, um, and manage all the dependencies of those packages for you. And it's also going to allow you to uh, create, save, load, and switch between uh, project-specific software environments. So this is what's going to allow you to have uh, the ability to manage these different environments is what's going to allow you to have um, multiple versions of, of Python or multiple versions of the same package installed on your system and isolated from one another in such a way that um, you don't run into problems. You don't end up with, um, with conflicting dependencies and things like that. 
um, a feature that separates Conda from other um, kind of solutions in this area is that Conda is a, uh, um, a multi-language uh, package manager. So you can package and distribute software for pretty much any language uh, using Conda. So you can use Conda to uh, manage R, Ruby, uh, Lua, Scala, Java, JavaScript, uh, C, C++, Fortran, um, pretty much anything. Um, and that makes it really powerful for data science and scientific computing use cases in particular because these workflows very often have, uh, depend on um, software that's written in multiple languages. Um, uh, I didn't have much experience working in bioinformatics or genomics before I came to CALS, but I've interacted with a lot of users here and seen my colleagues interact with a lot of users here. And uh, those workflows are often very complicated and have dependencies on maybe Ruby and Perl and Python. And you know, there might be some GPU accelerated things. There might be some JVM based uh, software. And all of these things have to be combined into a single workflow. And that's a very complicated uh, software management problem. And Conda is really good at solving those uh, those kinds of complicated software management problems. Um, just to kind of make some terminology uh, a bit more consistent, so a lot of people, uh, particularly when they're new to, uh, to Conda, confuse Conda and Miniconda and Anaconda. They, you, know, you can Google around and find, um, find resources for Anaconda and Miniconda and Conda you know, all, over the, all over the place. And there is some common confusion about exactly what is what. So uh, Conda is just a command line tool for um, managing packages and uh, their dependencies and for managing environments. So it's just, it, that's the core tool. And that's what I'm going to teach you how to use today, is how to use this Conda tool. Now, mini Conda is a distribution mechanism for distributing the Conda tool. So because Conda is cross-platform, it needs to be shipped with its own version of Python and some operating system uh, specific base packages. So if you're running on Windows, it's gonna need a different set of, of base packages to interact with Windows. If you're running on Linux and Mac, similarly, it's gonna need a different set of these base packages. So mini Conda distributes the Conda tool plus a, its own version of Python, so it doesn't depend or um, alter in any way the system Python, and then some operating system specific stuff, but that's it. Then there's Anaconda, and Anaconda is kind of the most, uh, a very common distribution of Python that is widely used in data science and scientific computing. Um, it comes not only with Miniconda, but with, at this point, several hundred different uh, packages you know, all of the, the things that you might have heard of or used before, like NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, Pandas, um, Numba, tons of stuff in the data science and scientific computing ecosystem. Um, and it also includes the Conda tool and Python and, and everything that is in Miniconda. So you can install either Anaconda or Miniconda locally on your, uh, on your system. I encourage you to install Miniconda, um, and then it's a little bit simpler, and it just allows you to um, uh, manage your workflow a little bit more efficiently in ways that we'll talk about in a minute. And I've provided um, instructions in the, uh, the setup, which I will share in the chat now. So up here at the top of the uh, course page, the course notes, lecture materials, uh, link to instructions for installing Miniconda. So if you don't have Miniconda uh, or Anaconda locally on your computer, you want to install it, it's fine. You can do so. There's instructions for that. Um, if you're interested in getting Miniconda installed on Ibex, I will also um, share a link in the chat 
to a, uh, a GitHub repo, which explains how you can install Miniconda in your home directory on IBEX so that you can use, um, uh, uh, more efficiently use uh, Conda on IBEX. Okay. Uh, okay. So package and environment management. So I don't want to go through kind of in too much detail the note, the lecture notes here. So you can read through them um, on your own. The way that I want to just kind of motivate this is that um, when you are when you are doing data science or scientific computing, there are a number of common problems that come up pretty much on any new project that you have. Um, so if you are, um, you know, you have a bunch of different research projects and the, an application that you need for one research project requires a whole bunch of different versions of uh, dependencies and base programming languages uh, that are different from the ones that are currently installed on your system and maybe different from what are needed for some other project that you're working on. Um, so you have, or you might have an application that you were working on as part of a previous research project. And since then you've updated a whole bunch of software on your system. And now you go back to work on that, that previous research project and nothing works because now the, the code for that, uh, that project is out of date with the new versions that you have on your system and you, you, either have to revert the versions on your system back to what you think they might have been when you were working on that previous research project, or you have to change the code in your research project to work with the newer versions of software in your system. Um, so all of this is, uh, is a bit of a pain. And, um, and, but these are common problems. You may have experienced these yourself. So what environment, um, an environment management solution does is it allows you to uh, define kind of project specific environments so that the software stack used on one project is completely isolated from the software stack that's used on another project. And that's what will allow you to have both you know, different versions of the same software that might be required for these different projects installed on the same system and isolated from one another in such a way that and you don't get any kind of cross project uh, conflicting dependencies. Um, a good software environment manager will allow you to also do all of this in a way that um, doesn't require you to have admin privileges on your, on your host system. And that's what makes it useful on systems like Ibex or Shaheen or other um, uh, managed clusters where you're obviously not going to have admin permissions to uh, to install a bunch of software. So there's the environment management problem, and then there's the package management problem. So once you, once you can isolate software stacks between your different projects, you of course have to manage the installation of software within each of those projects. And that's where package management comes in. And usually most of us are probably more experienced with package management than with environment management, because there's a lot of package managers out there. Um, if you use Linux, you're definitely familiar with package management because every version of Linux has its own uh, operating system package manager like Apt on Ubuntu or Yum for CentOS. Um, on uh, Mac OS X, there's a homebrew project. Um, not sure there's one really for Windows, um, but you're probably more familiar with package management. So, um, and that's what, what's nice about, um, and if you're coming from the Python ecosystem, you may have been, you're probably familiar with PIP. And so PIP is the standard package manager within the Python community. But PIP on its own does not, uh, or PIP does not provide a solution for the environment management uh, problem. So you can install all the, all the packages you want with PIP, um, but you can't manage environments um, with PIP. And that's what's nice about Conda is that it solves both of these, um, 
both of these problems with the same tool. So Conda is both an environment manager and uh, a package manager. And so it's going to allow you, whether you run Windows, Mac, or Linux, to create environments for your individual projects that isolate the software stack for those projects. And then it's going to operate as a package manager to install and manage packages within each of those environments. And um, it plays nicely with PIP. So if something's not available uh, directly via Conda, you can always use PIP to install things uh, within a Conda environment. And in fact, I, ins I install PIP in every Conda environment I create and use PIP frequently. So that's why I, ha I call my approach the kind of Conda plus PIP. So it's Conda wherever possible and then use PIP only when necessary. Um, all right, so that's kind of like the quick, very, uh, very wordy kind of explanation of what Conda is um, and how it solves two problems, environment management and package management. Um, it's platform agnostic, open source. Um, the package and environment management tool um, like Conda is uh, it's useful because it helps facilitate portability and reproducibility of data science workflows. So. Uh, or scientific computing workflows. So I often prototype on my laptop or workstation um, because I, I can get kind of quick interactivity very easily. And it's great for prototyping, but if I really need significant computing resources, particularly GPUs, then I need to run my, uh, run my software on, uh, typically I run it on Ibex. And um, Conda is the tool that I use to port my software stack um, from my system where I do my prototyping to uh, IBAX so I can run the same software stack and run my uh, same workflow but at a, a larger scale enabled by the uh, larger usage on um, a lar larger amount of resources on IBAX. Um, so Conda, the Conda plus PIP approach, uh, again, it solves both the package environment management problem but it targets multiple programming languages, and that's super useful for, um, uh, for data science and scientific computing workflows because they are often multiple programming language workflows. And there are other alternatives in the space, but they will typically either solve only environment management or package management or focus on a particular programming language. Okay, so any questions about um, kind of introductory uh, remarks about Conda before we start getting into the the hands-on portion of the, the workshop. So you can write your questions in chat. Um, if you wanna unmute yourself, if you don't mind having your question recorded, uh, you can um, unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Uh, you can also put uh, questions on the Gitter channel if you want. So anyone has a question? Ah, so there's a question on the Gitter channel. So how is it different from Kubernetes? Um, so Kubernetes is like uh, two levels abstracted from Conda. So uh, Conda is an environment and package management system. Um, Docker, which is kind of the step between something like Conda and say Kubernetes. So Docker is a general solution for uh, environment management using uh, Docker images and Docker containers. So that gives you um, operating systems level of, of isolation. And you can certainly install uh, your uh, Conda, or put a Conda environment and install things with Conda and PIP inside of a Docker image. In fact, you often will need to do that because Docker itself is more of an environment management solution, but you still need to solve the package management problem for every project. So you still have to install stuff inside the Docker image. And then Kubernetes is basically a, uh, a system for running um, collections of Docker, in, uh, Docker containers. And it's usually targeting like a multi-user system. So for example, Calst, the research, uh, IT research computing has a Kubernetes cluster. This Kubernetes cluster runs Docker containers that are based off of different images that have been provided by users who want to run Docker containers on that Kubernetes cluster. And then within those Docker containers, there might be Conda environments where you've got installed Python, 
and NumPy and SciPy or Scikit-Learn or TensorFlow or PyTorch as part of the job that's running inside the, the container that's running on uh, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is well outside the scope of, of what this training is on today. But hopefully that gives you some sense of, uh, um, of how, that go, how that goes. Um, and I'll come back and maybe put in a, a, a written answer in the, in the chat window. Uh, so there's a great question in the chat. So for Python, would you recommend Conda over virtual environment uh, to manage environments? So yes, I would. Um, and my reasons, uh, my reasons for doing this is that um, with virtual environment, so virtual environment together with PIP, can be used to solve the environment management and the package management problem. So you have to use virtual environments in conjunction with PIP. And PIP is great if you only are using Python dependencies. And if you don't need to manage um, like things like GPU dependencies. Um, and I've often found that for most of the users that I work with here at Calston, in my own work, neither of those things are true. I often have multiple programming languages that I need to support in my projects and um, almost always have GPU dependencies. And PIP can't really handle either of those cases well. Um, it's also um, another reason for preferring, uh, for preferring Conda the Conda plus PIP approach over the PIP plus virtual environment approach is that I've worked with a lot of users um, who inadvertently install things system-wide using PIP. And that creates uh, conflicts when they try to have uh, different projects going and using different versions of things and they've installed everything via PIP and all of a sudden they've got version conflicts. And it's because they're not using PIP in conjunction with a virtual environment or virtual environment to solve both of these problems. So using the Conda approach, you have one tool solves both of your problems um, and gives you some added advantages of being able to manage multiple programming language workflows and uh, GPU dependencies. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and jump. If there are no more, uh, if there are no more questions, then we'll move along to the second, uh, the second episode, working with environments. I'll just go back here, just check that I haven't lost connection to my my Jupyter Lab instance, because we're going to start using that in just a minute. Okay. So this is one of the uh, kind of the three core episodes of today's training. So the working with environments, sharing environments, and GPU dependencies. So we're going to cover uh, a fair number of commands in this episode. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, what is a common environment, how you create and delete environments, uh, how to activate and deactivate environments, um, how to install packages into existing environments using Conda and PIP. Um, where should you create your environments? Um, finding out what's been installed in an environment. Um, finding out what environments exist on your machine. These are all kind of like basic questions um, that you might want to, to, things that you might want to know how to use Conda to do. And at the end of this episode, um, you will have run commands to do all of those things, and that should leave you with some understanding of how Conda environments can improve your research workflow. And, you know, we'll get a lot of practice at running the commands to kind of to do all of these things, environment creation and deletion, activation, deactivation, um, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So what is a Conda environment? So a Conda environment is just a, a specially structured directory. That's it. So it's just going to be a directory, and it's going to contain um, there'll be some metadata and some other things in there. But really, you can think of it as a directory into which all of the software for your project or for your environment will be installed. Everything will be installed into a single directory 
on your machine. And this is what will allow you, if you have one research project that needs, say, one version of NumPy and another uh, project that you'd finished before that uses an older version of NumPy, you can have two different directories representing your Condit environments for these projects, and you can have completely different versions of software installed inside those directories without any problem. And you can make changes to one environment, install more software, remove software from one environment, it has absolutely no impact as to what is going on in the other environment, because they're just directories. You know, adding and deleting files from one directory on your computer does not impact anything else in, uh, in some other directory. Um, I have a question, can I ask? Yes. yes. Uh, I'm trying to get uh, into Jupyter Lab uh -huh. using Conda. But uh, it always gives me an error. So the uh, if I if I try to like type the command Jupyter Lab on Conda using Conda, uh, then the computer stops working for a while, and I have to shut down the terminal. If this is on your local uh, yeah your local machine. That's yeah. going to be a difficult problem for me to. Uh, uh, to diagnose and fix uh, in this okay. uh, in this particular context, the um, the sequence of commands that you would need to type to launch Jupyter Lab, we can talk about that. Or I'll have some examples of that later. Um, but it's going to be difficult for me to diagnose a problem like that, which sounds like it um, it's an issue with your machine that's outside the scope of of uh, this particular training, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Okay, um, so there's a little kind of a call out box here about avoid uh, installing packages into your base environment. So we'll talk about uh, the, base in, uh, the base environment more in a minute, but um, remember when I said that when you install uh, the mini condo or the anaconda distribution, they're going to come with a whole bunch of packages plus the Conda tool um, and a Python uh, installation. You can think of that as being your base environment. You don't want to install all of your project uh, libraries and packages um, into that base environment. Rather, you want to create individual environments for each of your projects and install software there. So the base environment should just be for Conda, its own version of Python and operating system specific stuff. So I will never install anything into a base, base environment. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna switch over to the, uh, to Jupyter Lab, and we're gonna start doing uh, the hands-on portion. And so I will be referring back to the, um, the lecture notes that I have up on a separate screen, but from pretty much the rest of the workshop, I'll be working from within Jupyter Lab, um, and we'll just be going through and demoing commands. Okay. All right. So the first thing we want to do is create an environment. Um, so in Jupyter Lab, so I know many of you might not have used Jupyter Lab, so I'll give you a quick kind of a quick tour. So over here on the left we have uh, kind of the file manager. And we can browse, browse through the file manager just like you would uh, you know, on any other application that you uh, probably use. So for example, if we double click on introduction to Conda, then, oh, did I lose my, I think I lost my Jupyter Lab. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So if we double click on introduction to Conda, um, you know, we've kind of, there's nothing in this directory yet. Uh, we're going to populate it with some things uh, in a minute. You'll see up here it says introduction to Conda. So this is basically the, the path to the directory. This is like your current working directory at the top of this launcher. Um, so here we could launch notebooks or Python consoles. Um, but 
we're not going to do that right now. Right now, we're actually just going to launch a terminal window. And so this is a bash terminal window. And from here, we're going to be typing, um, we're going to be typing our conda commands. Okay. And um, I very likely will be using um, some bash commands, some simple bash commands um, that we would have covered in last week's uh, bash training. Um, I'll try to mention what they are as I go along um, in case some of you didn't, uh, didn't make it to the bash training uh, last, uh, last week. Um, but again, just like today's course materials are online, the course materials from the bash training are online uh, and you can go and, and go through those training materials in your own time. Okay. So let's create an environment. So we're going to use the conda command. And we can do conda dash dash help and see the kind of the help menu for all of these different commands. Um, you can see these are kind of the, the major conda commands. Um, and if you type those commands and then help, you can see help for individual commands. Um, we'll be referring back to the help menu uh, quite a lot uh, throughout. Uh, throughout the afternoon. Okay, so let's do, but I'm just gonna type clear, which is a command that just clears the, the window again. So we're gonna do conda um, create, and you can create environments and give them a name. So we'll create uh, an environment, we'll just call this a Python 3 environment. And into that environment, we will install Python and pip. Now, um, notice I'm just kind of listing out here the, the packages that I, want to, that I want to install. So if I hit enter, um, the conda tool is going to uh, run off to the internet, collect the metadata that's associated with the packages that I want to install, and then it's going to start figuring out what the dependencies of those packages are and find a set of dependencies that um, do not conflict with one another, and then come back and say, okay, I found all these packages that are either the packages that you asked me to install or in dependencies of those packages. So let's look through here and just see what, um, uh, see what we have. Um, so first, there's a little warning here that there's actually a newer version of Conda that is available than the one that is uh, installed in this cloud instance. That's okay, we don't need to worry about that uh, too much. Um, so this package plan is what, as you're just getting, when you're getting started with Conda, you'll want to look at this package plan to kind of understand what is, um, uh, what is actually being installed. And so what we have here in this column is a list of packages. So these are all the packages that are actually being installed. And note that we actually only requested two packages, Python, and pip. And Conda went out and found the most recent versions of those packages and the most recent versions of all the dependencies of those packages, which are all these other things that are listed here, that are mutually consistent, that don't have any kind of packaging conflicts or anything like that. So that are guaranteed to work well and properly together. And then it is listing off like these are all of the things that were uh, that are going to be installed. And then it asks you if you want to proceed. And you can type Y for yes and hit enter. And then it's going to go off and download all of these packages and then install them into a directory um, on the machine in which Conda is running. So that's kind of the basic mechanics of what Conda does every time you're going to create an environment. OK. So there it is. So there's a first, uh, your first Conda environment. And then at the end, it's, it gives you kind of a, a helpful comment of, com of commands that you can run to activate this environment that you've just created. And we'll talk about activation and deactivation in a minute. OK. So that's the, the basic Conda create command. So let's look at another example. So I'm going to clear this out again. And then I'm going to press up, the up arrow will allow you to toggle through previously typed commands. So I didn't, um, I didn't specify any 
um, any version numbers when I created this environment before. And as a result, Conda just kind of ran off and got the most recent compatible versions of the packages that it could find. Uh, but often you might want to specify particular versions of these packages that you want to want to install. So for example, um, if I wanted to install uh, Python uh, 3.6 and a particular version of pip, um, then I would, the syntax for doing that is as follows. So you can put uh, 3.6, and pip equals uh, 20.0. And then you probably want to change your, your name to make it a bit more specific. So this is a Python 3.6 environment. Um, now it's important to give your, um, to, if you're gonna name your environments, it's important to give them a, a sensible name that will uh, let you as a human you know, user know exactly what's in the environment. Um, so I, I like to append the dash env to everything just to let know that it's uh, you know it's an environment. But then um, if I have like a project name naming convention, it would just be kind of project name dash env would be how I would name my my conda environments. So now if we hit enter, the same process is going to to go through again. But if you look at what's being installed. So now we have a different version of Python, Python 3.6.11. So .11 was the most recent version of Python 3.6 that Conda was able to find. And then pip 20.0.2 was the most recent version of pip 20.0 that Conda could find. And then these are all the dependencies. And then if you hit yes and enter, it Conda might have to download um, some more uh, packages because now these are potentially different versions than the ones that were previously downloaded. But there we go. So that's a second Conda environment. So personally, I, I would strongly encourage you to always specify version numbers when you're installing uh, packages with Conda, unless you're really just trying to prototype something really quickly. Um, by specifying version numbers, um, you will always know um, kind of exactly what is installed um, when you install it. And I think that that's really useful for kind of reproducibility uh, and portability. Now, um, in many cases, you might not know, uh, actually in most cases, you're probably not gonna know what packages, what versions are available of various packages. Um, so there's a command that allows you to search for packages and it's called conda search. So the conda search command, we can put in a package name like um, uh, scikit-learn. So scikit-learn is a, uh, a very popular machine learning library um, that is probably the most widely used machine learning library um, uh, today. Uh, it's entirely CPU based. Um, just out of curiosity, is anybody using um, uh, scikit-learn in their own work? If you could just check yes in the participants uh, section. Just want to try to get a sense of, of uh, okay, so we've got a few people using, uh, using scikit-learn. Okay, cool. Um, so these are all the different versions of, of scikit-learn that are available uh, via, via Conda. Um, so we have uh, everything from 0 0.23, which is the most recent version, all the way back to 0 0.17, which is from a couple of years ago, I think. OK. Um, now you can do a little bit of, um, of pattern matching. Um, with the conda search. We can actually do conda search help and get some more information about um, different options and things that you can pass to conda search um, to kind of identify packages and versions and things like that. Um, so here's an example of kind of wildcard pattern matching. Um, so for example, if, if you did uh, conda search uh, tensorflow, TensorFlow 
star. So that would give any package that starts with TensorFlow. So the TensorFlow, there's lots of different things that's besides the kind of like the base TensorFlow that are available via Conda. And if we take a look at this, um, then so there is uh, TensorFlow TensorBoard, TensorFlow Probability, TensorFlow MKL. This is a a um, Excel a CPU version of TensorFlow that is accelerated with Intel's MKL uh, linear algebra routines. Um, there's TensorFlow GPU, which is the uh, TensorFlow um, NVIDIA GPU accelerated build. Uh, and you'll see that some of these versions, like if you use TensorFlow 1.7, is very, very, very old. Um, but actually, if you come back up here, what you'll find is that this TensorFlow GPU is a newer kind of naming convention than this GPU base. And that has 2.2, which is almost the most recent version of TensorFlow uh, available. Then you've got just a whole bunch of other stuff for TensorFlow. So you can use this kind of pattern matching to search for um, um, different packages for, for libraries. Okay, so I'm going to clear this out again. Okay, so here's a more uh, a more elaborate example. So I'm going to get rid of this. Uh, we don't need that at the moment. Um, so let's create another environment. So conda uh, create name, and I'll call this uh, a basic. SciPy environment. And so in this basic SciPy environment, um, we will install uh, Python, um, IPython, uh, matplotlib, um, and numpy, uh, SciPy, pip, and let's, let's leave it at that. So these are kind of the, uh, and maybe pandas, why not? So these are, um, you know, IPython is short for interactive Python. If you've been using Python at all, you've probably almost certainly been using IPython from the command line because that's what gives you the nice kind of interactive uh, uh, Python experience. Matplotlib is a plotting library. Um, NumPy is your kind of core uh, linear algebra uh, uh, Python library. SciPy um, is kind of like a, a MATLAB kind of toolbox approach that brings a lot of um, a lot of those routines that you would expect to find in MATLAB um, into the Python ecosystem. So NumPy and SciPy together, you can think of as kind of like a MATLAB clone within the Python uh, ecosystem. Um, matplotlib actually would, got its start many years ago, um, probably close to 20 years ago now, as an attempt to bring MATLAB-like plotting functionality into the Python scientific computing ecosystem. Um, Pandas is your uh, data analysis library for working with uh, data frames. And then pip, um, sometimes we need pip to install stuff. So we always, always include pip. So notice I didn't put any version numbers. I put there's version numbers in the example uh, for this environment in the um, in the lecture notes, but I always like to run this to see um, how many new versions have been released since the last time I updated these lecture notes. Um, so let's go up here and look at the package plan. So in my lecture notes, I had NumPy 1.18. So where's NumPy? So here's NumPy. So there's a newer version of NumPy, 1.19 has been released. And SciPy down here is 1.5. So there's been another uh, version of SciPy. Matplotlib 3.3. .3. So there's been two new uh, releases of Matplotlib in the, since I last updated. And I bet IPython as well has had another significant update. So IPython has had five uh, new releases, so 7.18 versus 7.13. Uh, 
So um, this is just a, an example of kind of how fast a lot of these packages are changing and how, how difficult it can be if you install all the software system wide to, you know, constantly be updating to new versions of the software on your system and then constantly breaking the code that you're writing for different projects that might have you know, different constraints on the versions, uh, on versions that you would want to use. So a tool like Conda allows you to completely circumvent all of this because you can install a Conda environment for your research project, install the packages that you need and particular version numbers that work for that project and then you can always go back to those version numbers in that environment in that project and it will work. And you can, meanwhile, if you want to start a new project with newer versions of the same libraries, you can have a new Conda environment with completely up-to-date versions of all the libraries, install those and not have to worry about breaking um, software that works for projects that you're already got going. And these change a lot. I mean, I, I updated these lecture notes at the beginning of the summer. So in uh, probably June, I did a major overhaul of the lecture notes and changed all the version numbers and things like that. So just in the last uh, four months or so, there has been a significant change and that's not unusual. Okay, so we'll go down here and we'll hit yes. And because we installed a little bit more, more uh, software, it might take a little bit longer to kind of download and install everything. It's not gonna take you know, wildly longer. Um, but you can see, you know, all the stuff is installing. Now, I, I guess it's worth noting that um, obviously you need an internet connection to download all the packages. But once you've downloaded and installed all the packages, you can use your Conda environments and do your analysis without having it to have an internet connection, just in case there was any, uh, any doubt about that. Okay, so that's us done with the basic SciPy environment. Uh, so at this point, so we'll take a, a short break. I'll take some questions. There's an exercise that I would like you to do. Um, take a, a few minutes, so three minutes, and have a look at, um, this exercise uh, here, creating a new environment. So it gives you a chance to just kind of walk through um, the command that I just ran. I just ran three examples of this command. Um, and you can uh, try to create an environment called machine learning environment and install um, the packages that I have listed there. Okay. Um, and in the meantime, I will take your questions. You can either unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can ask it in the uh, um, in the chat, or you can post it together. Um, and um, I will just uh, stop sharing for a minute, and then you guys can ask questions. So we're just going to take kind of a three-minute little mini break. So you can take a look at that exercise um, and then have this opportunity to ask some, ask some questions. And if you happen, if you have questions that are, if you've used Conda, uh, if you have some experience using Conda and you have maybe a little bit more of an advanced question, you can also ask it now. Um, I may defer until later in the, in the workshop when we'll actually cover uh, that material. Um, um, but you know, feel free to ask any, any questions that you, that you might have. So there's a good question. So Francisco is asking, uh, if you request only IPython while creating an environment, does it install Python by default as well? Or does it use the Python in the base environment? It will install its own version of Python. So if you were to leave off Python and just try to install IPython, um, then what would happen is that uh, Conda would figure out that IPython depends on Python. So it would say, okay, well, I need to install, uh, I need to install a version of Python. 
And so then it would identify a kind of an appropriate version of Python and then install it in the environment, even if you didn't request it. So it's always going to find, like whatever packages you explicitly list, Conda will then use those packages to find a, uh, an acceptable set of dependencies for all of the packages that you request that uh, will work with one another. And so in the case of IPython, it depends on Python. So Python would get picked up in that manner. So what is better for a new project, using the basic environment or creating a new environment uh, with the least versions of all my required packages? So um, you can, so there's a command for cloning an environment. Um, I think we will, uh, I think we will talk about it, it later. Um, let me just, um, let me just take a little look at the help menu. Um, yeah, so we'll, I will try to cover that later, but basically, so there's a command that you can clone, that you can use to clone an environment. And so if you have, um, um, if you have a common set of packages that you, you like to use in kind of all of your projects, then what you could do is you could create uh, an environment called like, um, you know, my my default environment or something like that or um you know basic scientific computing environment and install versions of um uh, install versions of the packages that you use on all your projects in that environment and then you when you start a new project you could just clone that existing environment that has kind of all the stuff that you like to use um and then um just create a copy of that environment with a different name for your new project. So we'll see some stuff that's kind of like that, uh, but that's actually a good note. I don't have in these lecture notes, I don't think I have an example of using uh, the conda clone command. Uh, so what I am actually going to do is um, I'm going to make a note for myself about that. So introduction to Conda. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to go here and go to my GitHub issue tracker and put a new issue in here and will be um, add and Example of uh, cloning a conda environment. And the basic idea is that we have uh, commonly used packages go into a my common packages environment. And then you can clone this environment for all new projects. Uh, okay, so I will, that will be my note to self to add an example of that uh, for, uh, for, future, uh, for future iterations of this class. Okay, so oh, what happened? Did I lose my terminal again? I have lost my Jupyter again. And I wonder if I have also lost my environments that I created. I 
Ah, okay. Um, oh, no matter. I will uh, just quickly recreate. Them. So conda create uh, name basic sci-fi environments and what do I put in there? So uh, Python. PyPython, NumPy, SciPy, uh, pip, uh, and matplotlib. And now you can actually put this dash dash yes um, option to just avoid having to confirm that you actually want to install these things. So let's see, we've got some more, uh, more questions in chat. Um, so on Windows, so when you install a uh, Miniconda or Anaconda on Windows, so you will have a Anaconda command prompt and you will use the Anaconda command prompt um, to run these conda, uh, conda commands. Um, then are all scientific packages available in Conda? Um, so basically, yes. So while pip, pip is the kind of the default Python package uh, installer that will, any Python package that can be installed, you can install via pip. But the Conda and Anaconda um, really target the data science and scientific computing community. Um, that's their target user group, which is kind of a subset of, uh, of Python. So you can find all kinds of stuff, and not just Python on, on via Conda, but you can find all kinds of stuff. Like um, if you, like a lot of the scientific computing libraries, um, like uh, MPI, um, OpenMP, uh, Petsy, um, other like you know linear algebra libraries that are widely used in scientific computing are all available via Conda. Um, okay, so I need to do one more environment to kind of get to get caught back up. So that was the machine learning environment. So uh, we'll do uh, Conda create name machine learning environment. And I will install uh, PyPython, Matplotlib, Pandas, and Scikit-Learn. Oh, and I'm going to get an error here, I think. Um, you'll notice that I made a typo here, matplolib. So that package will probably not be found. Um, hopefully it will not be found. Um, and then you will get to see what an error looks like when Conda cannot find the packages that you have asked Conda to install. So this is kind of the error that you will get when that happens. It will say package is not found. It will give you a list of the package or packages that are offending. And this usually happens to me when I make a typo. Um, so that should work much better. Okay. So uh, just to kind of add a little bit more to Ashraf's question about, you know, are all scientific practices available via Conda? Uh, you will be, you especially when you're getting started, you'll be really surprised as to what you can find um, available for installation via Conda. There's a huge amount of bioinformatics software that is installable via Conda. There's a huge amount of, of kind of standard scientific computing software that's not Python based at all, but is installable via Conda. Um, because Conda has become a very wide, uh, widely used tool within the scientific computing uh, community.
So I will always go into Google. Anytime I need to install something, I will always go into Google and type Conda space and then the thing that I want to install to see if it's available via Conda. Uh, uh, and usually it will be. Okay, so this is a good time to transition to talking about activating environments. So we've, we've seen how to install a bunch of environments. Um, but if we want to switch between these environments that we've installed, then we need to um, um, we need to understand how to activate and deactivate environments. So when you activate environment, there's a couple of things that that happen. So one is um, the path to the directory containing your environment, as well as a few other environment variables um, or values, are prepended to your system path. And this is how, when you activate an environment, you start using uh, commands like Python or IPython or actually using your software. This is how your computer knows to use the versions of software that's installed in the environment that you wanted to activate. Because by activating the environment, it prepends the paths to the software um, uh, to your system variables. So then your computer will find the software installed in this environment first. The second thing it does is that it will run any kind of like activation scripts or set any other environment variables that are relevant um, for the packages that you have installed. The second step is really important for a lot of scientific computing and data science applications that require kind of complex environment setups um, that are easy to get wrong. And the creators of the, the Conda packages set these things up properly so that they will work and then those activation scripts are or those activation procedures are automated via a script, and that script gets run in the background by Conda when you type this uh, Conda activate command. So let's go ahead and uh, activate. I'm going to clear this out. So if we wanted to activate our uh, Conda, our basic SciPy environment, basic SciPy environment, we just type Conda activate and then the name of the environment. And then when you hit enter, Notice that the prompt changed. So over here, you have the name of the active environment. It becomes part of your prompt. And that's the default setting in the Conda uh, config file. Um, and I'm not going to talk about how to change your Conda config file today. Um, you can always ask questions on Slack or things like that if you, um, if you want to know more about those details. Um, I like the fact that the active environment is part of the prompt because that helps me remember, you know, what project I'm working on and, and what I should expect to be, to be active. Okay. And now if you were to type a command like which uh, Python, so which Python, so which is a program that takes the name of an executable, some other program, and then gives you the path to that executable on the file system. So you can see that if we want, so which Python is the Python that lives in the bin directory inside the basic SciPy environment directory. So that, that's a, like a way to do a sanity check that the version of Python that you want to use is actually the version within uh, the environment that you have active, basically. Okay. Um, so that's activating. You know, deactivation is just uh, conda deactivate. And that takes you out of the environment that we were in. And so now if we were to do which Python, we get a different Python, a Python that lives in this, uh, this notebook environment, um, which we didn't create. It was actually one of the environments that uh, was created by uh, the Binder Hub template. That, was used to create this uh, JupyterLab instance. OK. Um, now, if you do conda deactivate um, maybe once too many, then it might look like, oh my gosh, I've lost my, um, um, I've lost my, my environment. So now if we were to do which Python, I'm not actually sure what we'll get. Uh, ah, we're still getting the same Python, so we haven't really done anything. But if you want it to come back, you can just do a conda activate um, 
base is the name of the base environment and that will take you back to the base the base environment and this base environment so this is actually where um conda itself is installed and then it has its own binary directory which has its own version of python and remember this this is the base environment we never install anything into the base environment we always create a new environment and install things there. This base environment is just for Conda to have the things that it needs to interact with your operating system and function properly. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna skip over the, uh, the exercises on activating and deactivating machine learning environment. You can um, you know, get plenty of practice with that. Um, so let's talk about the next topic. So what if you know, I want to install a package into an environment that already exists? Uh, how would I do that? Well, so the command uh, for that is conda install. But before we install, we need to activate the environment in which we want to install package into. So um, let's activate the basic SciPy environment. And then we're going to install um, package called number and uh, if you've never heard of the number project it's definitely worth um, uh, familiarizing yourself with and we'll take a look at that while number is installing so if you do conda install number and hit enter it's going to conda is going to do like a little mini um, it's the same process, actually, that it went through when we ran the conda create command, except now it's going to go off and get metadata about number. It's then going to check what dependencies number has. It's going to check whether or not any of those dependencies have already been installed in the environment. And it's going to find versions of everything that are consistent with what's installed in the environment. Um, and if it needs to, it might uh, go ahead and update uh, some uh, packages that are in the environment in order to install this new dependency so that everything is consistent and works properly. So there's a lot of work that's going on in the background um, that's being a lot of complexity that Conda is managing for you so that you are hardly ever even need to be aware of. So that's it. Um, so great question on the, on the chat. Can we simply use CD instead of conda activate to switch between environments? The answer is no. Um, so CD is a command. Um, if you've not used uh, bash commands before, uh, CD is a command for changing, uh, changing directories. So if you did CD introduction to conda, then that would change you into the introduction to conda directory. Um, no, so even though a conda environment is a directory that has a bunch of stuff installed into it, when you run the conda activate command, it adds a bunch of things to your system path variable, and it runs a bunch of activation scripts. So just CDing into a different directory, you would then have to manually run a bunch of stuff to kind of do what the conda activate command does for you which you really wouldn't want to do because there are many ways that you could do it incorrectly. Um, so then there is a question, how to list all created environments. So we're going to see that. Um, uh, we'll see that command in just a minute. Um, but I'll run it here. So the command is conda emv list. Um, and I'll talk more about this command uh, in a minute. How can I retrieve the same environment in different working sessions? Are they auto saved? Um, so, uh, Yumna, do you mean um, within the context of like the binder hub that we're doing now or kind of in your own work? Because it's a little bit different depending on what you're concerned about. Because the, the binder hub sessions that we're working in are, are a bit ephemeral. Um, once the session kind of gets cleaned up in the background or kind of dies, then we restart it and we lose all the, the context. But in general, 
if I was running these commands on my local machine, then I physically installed things in my file system. So it will be there so long as my file system is still accessible. So Whether if I'm working if I'm working on the binder hub, I can't retrieve the same environment after the session is ended. Yes, on binder hub that, that is true because the this you're you're using cloud resources, but then if the the session times out and the uh, those resources are kind of reclaimed by Google or by my counts, then you have to kind of start a new session and then you'll lose that, that context. So it's best just to kind of try to keep your, your session active. That's happened to me once uh, already. I had to go back and quickly recreate from the lecture notes some environments. But in general, that's not, in general, that won't be true. If you're working on your local machine or you're using, um, you know, IBEX, or you're using uh, the IT research computing has a Jupyter hub, which has persistent storage between sessions. In those contexts, you won't lose any, uh, any environments. Thank you. Okay. Good questions, guys. I appreciate uh, the, the extra interaction. It makes me feel like I'm not just talking to myself in a room in my house. Okay. So Numba, uh, I wanted to mention Numba in particular. So Numba is a just-in-time compiler that targets uh, a subset of Python that is really geared towards data science and scientific computing and, and um, creates uh, machine code targeting that is hardware optimized. So you can use Numba and use its different kind of decorator functions to take a function that you've written in Python and have it compiled to run on a GPU, for example. Um, or, and it uses something called uh, LLVM, which is a, a kind of an industry standard compiler uh, tool chain. And it will give you basically native performant code um, and with basically you not having to learn anything besides Python and then which of these number decorators that you need to use. So it's a very effective way for speeding up and accelerating your Python code to target uh, the hardware that you have available here at Cals, whether it's Ibex uh, uh, or Shaheen, without having to actually write the code in low level, you know, C or C++. And the compiled machine code that this generates is very efficient, and you would have to be a very competent uh, uh, programmer in these low-level languages to produce something that would be competitive with what Numba will generate for you automatically. So it's a really powerful library. I recommend you look more into it if you feel like it might, uh, it might help you. OK, um, so we installed Numba. So let's do the same. So I'm going to go back. Uh, so let's do the same command again. Um, so conda install. So we're going to install another library into the basic SciPy environment. Um, we didn't install scikit-learn, so let's install uh, scikit-learn. Um, we can also provide a, um, a version number. So I think 0 0.23 is the most recent version of scikit-learn. And if we hit enter, uh, then this will figure out, like, kind of will figure out whether it can install scikit-learn 0 0.23 into this environment and whether it needs to make any changes to the environment in order to, to install. And um, nope, it's just going to install uh, scikit-learn 0 0.23. I can say yes. And it has to install a couple of extra dependencies, and that's done. So there's a couple of examples of, um, of how to install packages into an existing environment. So now I want to take another short break, maybe a three-minute break. And there's an exercise um, that I would like you guys to attempt. Um, here. Where is it? Ah, there's a couple of exercises. Um, 
so the first exercise is to install Dask. So Dask is a, another package that you should be aware of if you're doing scientific computing um, or data science in Python. So Dask is a library for scaling, um, scaling up on one node or out across multiple nodes um, your uh, Python computations without having to muck about with, uh, with MPI or any low level um, um, communication between low level languages for communicating between nodes. Dask handles all of that for you. Um, it has a, a very kind of pandas like API if you're used to, uh, if you have some experience using pandas and is be very quickly becoming kind of a cornerstone package in the data science, scientific computing ecosystem uh, inside of Python. So it's definitely something that you want to be uh, that you want to be familiar with. And also it has tight integration with GPUs. So if you have a GPU computation that you want to scale out and up, um, you can do that with, uh, with Dask. So in this exercise, you will install Dask. Um, and then there's another exercise that shows you how to use, or asks you to use pip to install a package that's not available via Conda into your um, uh, into your Conda environment, into also into the machine learning environment. So let's take um, a few minutes to look at those exercises, and I will take questions um, if anybody has uh, questions. Sorry, David, <clears throat> uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. I'm basically a beginner with most of the programming on here, and I think I'm, I'm, I've sadly missed the last session. Okay. I wanted to know if, like, would you advise to just wait for the next semester or you repeat the first session so I can pick up from the start? Or, or like, no. some of the uh, term, yeah? Yeah, so n I would, so I, I would not. So um, there is probably more dependency between this episode or this training and the, the bash training because we are using the terminal and and we spent a lot of time learning the very basics of the terminal last time but the course materials are all online um, and um, you can go through the materials kind of on your own um, you know if you budget it out about half a day um, at the weekend or in the evening or spread it over a few evenings or something you should be able to go through the the materials from um, last week's workshop, you can use the, the Cows Binder Hub or the, um, or the Public Binder Hub to, to do the hands-on portions if you want, or you can, you know, do it locally on your own, uh, on your own computer if you want. Um, but I would not um, forego attending the, the follow-on workshops, uh, particularly the Python one uh, next week, which is a bit um, standalone. Um, in some sense. Oh, okay, that's, that's good to know. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the previous workshop will be available on YouTube, the, the live version that I recorded. Um, we're still having some, some uh, technical issues kind of sorting out exactly how to structure the YouTube channel, um, but we will be releasing it uh, shortly. Um, there's also a plan to record kind of like archival or reference versions of the individual episodes of all of the data science trainings and make those available as playlists. And then between the kind of archival reference episodes and the live stream recordings, which we make of these, um, of these trainings, there should be uh, more than enough kind of material online for people to kind of get, uh, uh, get caught, caught up. Okay, uh, Ashraf, does Conda only work with PIP or does it also integrate with apt and Linux? Okay, um, so apt is, um, you know, is an operating system package manager for Ubuntu. And if you are using, you use apt to install um, packages and their dependencies that are, that are used by your operating system to do stuff. So yes, you can install Python with apt, and yes, you can install um, pip with apt, um, but when you do that, you are um, 
changing the dependencies on which your operating system is, is using. And you typically don't want to muck about with the internals of your operating system just to install software that you're going to use for your scientific computing or data science projects. So you should think of Conda and apt as like similar, but used in two different situations. Like you would only use apt or yum or RPM. Um, if you, um, if you need to install stuff, that is truly system-wide on which all packages or all software in your operating system needs to work. Um, and then you use Conda and PIP to install stuff that is for your, your research or your, uh, your projects. Okay, so that was my little timer. So let's go back to uh, sharing the screen. And so let's install Dask, and then I'll show how to install uh, this combo package. Uh, can I ask you to, uh, yeah, go ahead, please. And in, in all those examples, like I'm looking now at the solutions, uh, is always specified the version of the software that we are going to install. Does it matter that much? Or if I just put like the name of the software, so for example, Conda install or pip install, and the name of the software, does it change a lot or what? Um, so what changes is, the, is obviously the version. So for the, um, looks like I have got to get my JupyterLab back again. Um, what changes is the, is the version. So if you don't put the version numbers, you're always gonna get the, the latest. Uh, the latest. Which is, which might be fine uh, for what you, uh, what you need to do. But by specifying, I think it's a good habit to uh, get into specifying the version numbers because that way you, are in a habit of recording which versions that you're, that you're using. Now we'll see some examples of how to extract the information about what versions are actually installed later. Um, but I personally have found it a best practice to always specify the version numbers. And uh, if I, by mistake, uh, I forgot to put the version. Can yeah. I like uh, suppress uh, the previous software with the, with the version that I specify later or? How does it work? Like, if I do the command again, specifying the version, do I erase the previous software or it, what it does? Right. So if it needed to, um, if it needed to, um, it would uninstall the previous version and then reinstall the newer version. And any, it would also uninstall any dependencies whose versions needed to be updated and things like that. So we're going to see some examples of uh, of that uh, in just a minute. I've got to get back my uh, pandas. What was the other? Uh, and sec hit learn. Hmm. I will have to ask my colleagues at Research Computing IT how long the timeout setting is for the Binder Hub instances. Is anybody just out of curiosity? Is anybody else having the same uh, having the same issue that you're finding that the Binder Hub instance is kind of timed out on you, and you're having to uh, having to restart it? Oh, yes. OK, so that is happening to a few few other people. Okay, You can try using the, uh, the public binder hub. It might have a longer setting on the timeout, uh, the timeout parameter. And I'll make a note to kind of follow up with uh, my colleagues at IT Research Computing um, to try to see if we can set the timer to be a little longer. Um, OK, so we want to install Dask. So we're going to do conda install dask. 
And Dask is actually going to install quite a lot of stuff because as you might imagine, you know, if you're going to have a library that's capable of scaling Python, uh, uh, Python computations kind of up on a single node in a cluster, but also out across multiple nodes in a cluster, that it might have quite a lot of dependencies that are required in order to make that happen. So as we'll see, um, Okay, so just passing along, so in the chat, just to make sure everybody was aware. So the public binder hub seems to be staying longer. Um, so I would suggest that for, you know, if you're finding that your, your session is timing out, then maybe switch to the, the public binder hub and I'll make a note to um, improve the settings uh, going forward. David, I have a question regarding installing these packages. If you already have like Conda installed on your local PC, when you uh -huh. make all these changes and trying to download and install packages, it does that automatically when you put in the input on the terminal, right? So it will, it will download those every, yes. okay. Let's check. Yes. So if it, if um, one of the things that Conda does quite a lot in the background is it caches a lot of things. So um, if Conda realizes that you need for one project, the exact same version of a package that it's already downloaded and installed for some other project, it's not going to uh, duplicate that download and therefore take up all the additional memory required to install a simple duplicate copy. It will do some clever things with symbolic links in the background to make sure that each project that uses the exact same version of a particular package is using the same version on disk, basically. Um, so, uh, excuse me? Yes? Uh, I have a question, uh, which is the problem all the time happened to me. Uh, when I try to activate the environment and, uh, and use which uh, to ensure that I'm using the package under this environment, uh, I see that all the time uh, I am using the packages that installed in the basic. And this is on uh, one of the Jupyter hubs that we're, we're using now or on your own computer? Uh, it happened uh, uh, into both my okay. local terminal and the uh, binder hub. And are you remembering to put the, the name? So for example, um, so if I run which Python now, it's going to be in this notebook uh, environment. But if I do conda, activate and remember you've got to put the name of the environment yeah i put the name uh, and also uh, the path not include uh in the in this uh, directory here uh, the, that i find a a bit mysterious because it's um so you're basically typing the exact same kind of commands that I'm typing here, but you're not getting, yeah. um, can you copy and paste the, yeah. the equivalent of this into the, um, into the chat, please? Okay, this is the bar. Um, okay. I will try the local here. Uh, even that, I activate the, the environment. Okay, so this is, um, you, in your path here, this is a uh, pi in, so that, is pointing to IPython, not Python. So what command did you type to get that? And this isn't a conda path. This is a path for um, a different um, virtual environment package called pyenv, um, which if you've installed, uh, it's gonna be very difficult for me to, in, to debug kind of local computer issues. So for the purposes of, of this training, let's focus on making sure that we're seeing the same thing um, inside of Binder Hub. So if you could copy, so this looks like it's from Binder Hub. Yeah, this, this is from Binder Hub. 
Okay, and um, so that is the base Python. So if um, if I were to do con, whoop, um, if I was to type conda deactivate, and then conda deactivate, and now look at which, uh, and then maybe conda activate base. Yeah, then you will get this this Python. So from there, if you were to type conda activate, and then if you've created the machine learning environment, then that should give you the, uh, that should activate the machine learning environment, and then you should get a different Python. Um, I will try this. Thank okay. You. Okay. Okay. Um, and we wanted to install, so combo. So this basically the, the utility of this exercise was to show you how to use pip and conda together. Um, so combo is a really interesting package for doing something called ensemble learning, which is where you have a whole bunch of models and each of those models on their own might be like kind of okay at predicting, classifying something or forecasting something. But if you combine all of these, um, these simple models into one big model, then you can often boost your performance um, with relatively little additional work. And this is called ensemble learning. It's a technique for taking, um, uh, aggregating the, um, predictions of simple models into a better overall prediction. And Combo is a tool for doing that. It's very widely used on, uh, in CACL competitions. Um, it's also, you know, a very cutting edge kind of research tool. Um, there's a nice launch binder button here. So they even, they have binder integration, so you can uh, play around with it on, on binder. Um, but we want to install it into this environment. So once we've activated an environment, we can run which pip, and we can see here that uh, the pip that we're using is the pip that is in our machine learning environment. Yep. So we can then do pip install combo. And you can see it checks, it needs to have joblib and matplotlib and numpy, but these things were already installed in, um, were already installed in the conda environment. PIP detected that because we were using the PIP from that conda environment. That's very important. Um, and then there's some other things that, uh, uh, that it needed to install as well. Um, you know, it installs Numba down here. I don't think I had installed Numba in that uh, environment. Um, stats models, which is a, a statistical modeling package, some other things, and then combo itself. So we can do it clear. Okay. Um, so that would be an example of, of basically you, you activate an environment and then once you've activated it, um, you can run pip install to install things that are only available via pip into that conda environment. But I suppose it's, I want to just mention this again. It's really important to install PIP in every conda environment you create because it's often true that PIP is just available on the operating system because your system Python will use PIP to install things. And if you don't install PIP in your conda environment and you inadvertently run a PIP install, it will probably work, but it will install that package not in your conda environment, but wherever pip would install things on your operating system. So some completely different directory. And it will create very difficult to debug uh, errors. And I see this a lot when I'm dealing with users who are installing things with pip on Ibex. They inadvertently, they think they're installing inside their conda environment or inside some virtual environment that they're using, but they're really installing it somewhere else that's completely different. And it takes a really, good while to kind of figure out what's going on. 
So using Conda and always installing PIP inside a Conda environment, and therefore always using the PIP inside that Conda environment to install things that are available via PIP is a really good uh, important kind of best practice to follow. Okay, um, so where do Conda environments live? Um, so Conda environments are directories, so they have to live somewhere on your file system. Uh, typically, if you install mini Conda in your user home on IBEX, for example, um, your, in your user home directory, you will have a mini Conda 3 directory, which will have an ENVS directory, which will then contain all, the, all of your environments. Um, on Binder, things are a little bit different just because of the Docker image that, on which these Binder uh, instances are created. So the Conda environments actually live in this, uh, in a, this slash SRV Conda ENVS. And if you look there, you will see the list of all the environments that we created. Now, I've had to restart this instance a few times. And so I only have notebook and machine learning in. But if you've been here, since the beginning, and you haven't lost your instance, you would also have basic SciPy environment, um, Python, Python 3, Python 3.6 uh, environments would all be there. OK. But if we don't want to install our environments here, we can actually install them in a different location um, by using a slightly different command. So um, let's create a different environment. So I'm going to. Uh, conda deactivate. And, hmm. I look. It looks like I have. Yeah, so I've lost. So something is a bit flaky today in the. Uh, in the cast. Uh, binder hub. So I'm going to go to the public binder hub. Do, do, do. So I appreciate everybody uh, bearing with me with these little kind of uh, technical difficulties that happen from time to time. There's no, um, it simply would not be possible to provide um, this kind of training uh, to such a large group remotely um, without uh, a service like Binder uh, or the Kaust, uh, the Kaust Binder Hub. Um, and these things will get tuned and will, particularly on the Kaust Blender Hub side, since it's a new, new offering, this is the first semester that I've taught with it, so we'll have some fine tuning to do with the settings and things like that. Um, but we'll get there, uh, we'll get there eventually. So, um, right, I'm not going to go back and create any more environments right now. So if we wanted to create an environment, but it put it in a different location, so I'm currently in my home directory. So I will change into the introduction to Conda directory. And then I will use a bash command called make dir to make a, a directory. I'll just call it my project directory. And then I'll change directories into this project directory that I just created. Now. I'm going to create a Conda environment. So you can see off here to the left, my project directory is now showing up in the file browser. So I'm just going to double click on that. So I'm going to create a Conda environment inside my project directory instead of creating it in um, the kind of default location for environments. So I'll do a command Conda, uh, Conda uh, create. And then instead of name, I'm going to put dash dash uh, prefix. And then I'm going to provide the path to the directory into which I want to create the environment. And if the directory doesn't exist, Conda will create the directory. And I always use 
inside my project environments, I always define uh, the directory E and V. And then the dot slash is bash notation for inside the dot represents the current directory slash, we're going to create a directory E and V. And inside that directory, we're going to install our conda environment. So now I'm going to do um, a slash because I'm going to do a multi-line command in bash just to kind of keep uh, everything visible for, for you guys. So we will install uh, Python. Um, IPython at plotlib pandas um, and well, since I hit enter, I've got to install something else. Uh, scikit learn. And so this is going to create an environment. It's going to do the same thing that we, with the, what's going on behind the scenes is exactly the same as when we did conda create dash dash name. The difference now is only the location of the directory that we're going to get. Instead of going into the default location, it's going to install into a subdirectory called env of the project directory or of the current working directory, technically, which, because I, I ran the change directory cd command, is my project directory that I created. And in a minute, over here, you'll see this little env directory pop up once it's done installing everything. And this is something that I find uh, is, a, is a, a best practice that I would strongly recommend that you, uh, that you do in your own work. So instead of installing um, Conda environments by name into the default location, always install into a EMV directory inside your project directory. Uh, the reason for this is that, um, well, the primary reason is that it really helps in capsulization. It puts all of your project files in one place, including the entire software stack for that project. It's just there in your projects directory. Um, and the other is that it, it's the same command. So if you do condo create dash dash prefix dot slash env, you, that's the same statement. You can use it for all of your projects. As long as you, you know, are inside your, um, your project directory, when you run that command, it's the same command. You just run it over and over again. And so it makes it just easier to kind of remember what, what you're doing. And if we want to activate this environment, instead of providing the name, we do conda activate EMV. And I just made a mistake with my spelling. OK. Now our path has gotten really long, which is uh, uh, mildly annoying. But now the default setting in the conda config is to put the path, if you don't have a name for your environment, then it's just going to put the path, the absolute path from the root of your file system all the way down to the directory containing the environment. And if we go over here in the file browser, we can actually look and see what is in this environment. So our environment has a bin directory. And these are all binary uh, executables for different programs that have been downloaded. Um, so there's pip and the Python in here. There's a bunch of stuff. These are images, image binary programs, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, but they all have the all kind of environments have this particular kind of structure. They have a bin directory. You know, there's a lib directory, um, and inside the lib directory. There's a whole bunch of, these are compiled libraries. Um, if we had, like, there's a C++ is in here. Um, Open Blast is, is a linear algebra uh, compiled executable. Um, 
so Fortran stuff in here. These are all NumPy and SciPy uh, uh, kind of dependencies. Um, so lots of stuff in there. OK. Um, so another nice thing about using the ENV naming convention for your, um, your environments is that that directory is automatically ignored by the standard Python uh, git ignore file if you're using git as your version control system. And there's going to be a training on git later this semester if you're not familiar with git. Um, but that's an, a nice feature. Um, obviously, we don't want to version, you wouldn't want to version control this entire EMV directory. This could be gigabytes of stuff that uh, is in this directory, um, depending on how big your uh, software environment is. Um, we wouldn't want to version control that. So it's nice to have it kind of automatically ignored. OK. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in the notes just to wrap up um, kind of listing contents of environments and things. And then um, and then we'll take a five minute break and there are some exercises in the, that you can go through um, and then you can ask, I'll give you an opportunity to ask some more questions. So um, listing existing environments. So we talked about this earlier. So I'm just gonna deactivate this environment and clear. Um, and then uh, I'm just going to CD to go back home. So if you want to list the environments that are on your on your system, you can do conda env list, and this will list all of the notebooks or sorry notebooks, all of the environments that you've created. So this these two were were provided by the Docker image that we're using uh, for this course that's running on the various binder hubs. This one, note that there is a blank here. So there's no name for this one, but here's the path to the environment that I just created. Um, and then this asterisk indicates which environment is the currently active environment. Um, let's see, there's another question in the chat. Uh, is it possible to create more than one environment in the same directory by using prefix? Um, yes, you could. So if you had, um, if you wanted to, uh, to do that, you would just run, um, well, so now I need to go back to introduction to Conda, um, my project dir. And then once you're in your project directory, so here we've got this EMV, so you could run, um, Let me just go up here and find, gosh, it would have been uh, just as easy to uh, reinstall it or rerun the command again. So if we did conda uh, create prefix, and then we did uh, other env, and then I'll just do python. Um, something simple. So Python and uh, I'll just put Dask and let it get a bunch of stuff. So here now, uh, so in a minute, there's going to be a other dash env directory that'll open over here. So yeah, so you could put, you know, if your project needed, um, you know, for a very complicated uh, uh, workflow or pipeline, you know, maybe you actually want to, even within the project that you're using, you have different workflows and each workflow has a different set of software dependencies. Then you could have multiple conda environments for the same project, each of which could be in a different environment or a different directory like we've done here. And then you could just switch back and forth between activating the environments by, um, 
by the path. So you would do, um, for example, I could do conda activate EMV to activate that environment, or I could uh, conda deactivate the environment and conda activate uh, the other environment. Um, okay, um, so Ertaza is getting a, uh, an error. Conda uh, create prefix dot slash env. Lib pandas. Does it eventually, um, Ertaza, does that eventually complete correctly or does it um, give an error? Because sometimes, um, Sometimes I have seen, you know, now it's okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sometimes the first time it looks for, uh, so there's many locations where Conda will look to get metadata about packages. And sometimes if um, the metadata servers have not, have not been updated, then it might um, find old metadata on one server and then it has to go to another server and it finds the more recent metadata. But generally it should be okay. The only time it will fail is generally if you have a typo. Um, generally. Okay. Um, so we did listing environment. So listing the contents of an environment. So we just installed uh, Dask into this, uh, this other environment. So if we run a conda um, list on the active environment, then this is going to list off all of the packages and the version numbers. The name of the package is in the left column. The next column is the version numbers. The next column is something called the build number, which we haven't talked about yet. And then the last column is the channel, which is kind of the uh, online repository of packages where um, Conda downloaded the package from. So that's how you can see kind of what's installed in the current environment. You can also do, um, uh, so here I'm just going to list. So if I wanted to see what was in a notebook environment, I could do Conda list dash dash name notebook and that will list everything that is installed in the notebook environment so i didn't create this environment they didn't create this notebook environment um it was created by the binder hub uh engine um but you can see it has the same information and that's just the syntax um straight out of the lecture notes for how to do that um, Similarly, if I wanted to do the list of the contents in the environment in this path, dot slash env, so this is so this is the currently active environment, but if I wanted to list the contents of the environment in this other directory, I could just provide the path to that directory. <clears throat> And then this is the contents of packages and environment at, and then here is the absolute path from the root of the file system down to the environment. And then these are the versions of everything that's in there. So that's how you would list. Um, and this is how you can figure out, um, incidentally, if you install things without version numbers, you can use this command to figure out exactly what versions of packages are installed. Okay, and finally, um, deleting environments. So um, you might want to delete environments if you're no longer using them or if you create an environment and you broke it in some way and you just want to get rid of it. Um, there is a command for doing that. Um, so I'm just going to deactivate, uh, deactivate 
There we go. Um, so in the, the lecture notes, there's an example of the conda remove by name. So I will do a conda um, remove by prefix. And I will remove by prefix. And I will remove other EMV. Ah, no package name supplied. Yes. So if you wanted to remove a particular package, so by default, the remove command is not going to remove the whole environment. Rather, it expects you to list out particular packages that you want to uninstall or remove from the environment. Um, but here, I just want to typically uninstall all of the packages. So I'll just pass the all option. And then it will always ask me to um, confirm unless I was to put another option dash dash yes, which I typically don't do when I'm removing things just to give my brain a chance to double check that I am doing what I want to do. So I will say yes, I want to remove this. And <clears throat> because the con environment is just a directory, effectively what happens is the file system just deletes the directory, but then also cleans up uh, the conda metadata so that if you were to do conda EMV list, you no longer see this other environment that we just deleted. It's gone now. Okay. Okay. Um, so there are some exercises in the lecture notes, which I skipped over. So now we're going to take a, a short five minute break. Um, and I will give uh, at least a break for you guys. I'll give you um, an opportunity to, I may go get a cup of coffee and then I'll be back. Um, you can take a look at these exercises. Um, where were we? So I think, so there's some exercises in here about activating environments via path, creating new environments, um, and just basically the rest of the exercises in this, uh, in this episode. And then I'll grab a cup of coffee and I'll come back and then we can, um, you can resume asking questions or um, just working on the exercises for a few minutes. And then uh, we'll move on to the next, to the next episode. Okay. So unless there's any burning questions, I'm going to go grab a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and then, uh, and then I will come back. Okay. Okay. And I'm just going to pause the recording for a moment while I uh, go grab a cup of coffee. Okay. I'm back. I've got my coffee. So we're still on, on break. But feel free to uh, ask me any questions uh, that you might have. I can sit here and drink my coffee and answer your questions if you have any. And you can unmute and ask him, or you can put them in the chat, or I see there's some questions in Gitter, so I'm going to go ahead and um, respond. So,
So I'm answering on Gitter, I'm answering this, the question about apt, um, the relationship between OS level package managers like apt and conda and pip. And I just want to rephrase or reiterate something I had said earlier. So, so apt and these kind of other OS level package managers are performing a similar uh, function as uh, conda plus pip. Um, but for your but for your operating system uh, rather than your your data science project. So that might be a better way to put it than what I said earlier. Um, something else that is true is that there's a lot of um, where this is where Conda actually um, is can be really useful sometimes is. There might be some software that is available via uh, OS level package managers um, that you can actually install via Conda. Um, an example of this might be like sometimes you would install, um, you might install compiler tool chains are often installed via OS system package managers. And you can install compiler tool chains via Conda. Um, and that's really useful. That would be really useful on IBEX um, because on IBEX, you won't be able to use the OS level package managers. Um, those are only, uh, you have to have admin permissions to use those. And the, so your sysadmins will be the ones that would have to install any packages that are available um, via um, yum or, or apt or, or things like that. Um, but if you wanted to install those packages um, and maybe different versions than the ones that were available on, on IBEX, then you can install those using Conda um, and, um, and they will install into your Conda environment, which is in your user uh, namespace. And so you can install whatever you want. So I'll make a note of that as well in the um, in the Gitter channel. Timer. Okay, let's see if there's any. Okay, um, so there's a question to so trying out the Anaconda prompt. So yes, on the Anaconda prompt, the Conda commands will work, but bash commands will not work uh, because Windows is not a, um, a well, it's not a Unix based operating system. Um, so bash is a Mac or Linux commands. Windows has its own commands for those, those kinds of, of operations, at least some of them. So like, um, I think make dir and CD should still work. Um, but some of the other commands will not, uh, will not work on Windows. Um, and then is, uh, is using IBEX the same as using our own system or do we have to configure it to run our Python code? So you should install, um, uh, you should install uh, Miniconda yourself in your home directory uh, on IBEX. 
Um, there is a link, I'll, I'll reshare it here since the, uh, the question uh, came up again. Yeah, so the, again, about the Windows command. So yes, yeah, so there's not a problem uh, with Conda. It's just that your Windows is a, has different internal operating system commands than a Unix-based system. So which doesn't work. I think there's a where command um, on Windows, but I don't use Windows myself, that, so I'm not entirely certain. Um, uh, right, OK, so link to install instructions for Miniconda on IBEX. So that link will take you to the Git repo with instructions on how to install Miniconda into your home directory on IBEX. But once you do that um, and you follow the instructions in that script, then you will have um, uh, the Conda command and the Conda activate command um, no, I'm not still sharing my window. I will uh, in a minute, um, um, Natalia. But the that will help you get set up with Miniconda on IBEX. And then everything, once you have that, then everything is the same. The same commands we've been typing in the terminal, you can type those into, uh, into IBEX. And then, um, and then you can create your own Conda environments, and then you can um, um, you know, use Conda as part of your, your IBEX job. So like the, the integration, really going into the integration between uh, using Conda on IBEX is a little bit beyond the scope of this particular training, where I just wanted to kind of expose you to Conda and the, the general approach to, uh, to using Conda. Um, we may have some training uh, later this semester um, at one of the uh, the IBEX clinics put on by my colleagues at the Cal Supercomputing Lab, uh, where I will come and give a uh, more focused introduction to Conda, but specifically on IBEX, where we'll, we'll all, all log into IBEX together and, and use Conda um, on IBEX, basically. Okay, uh, so I think that was my timer gone off. And let me just check, do I still have, I do still have a JupyterLab instance, so that's great. All right, so I will start sharing my screen again. And we will pick up with the next episode in, um, Will hide my unseemly number of tabs that I have open in my other browser window. Okay, so sharing environments. So we covered all the basics in the previous episode. In this episode, I'm going to talk about um, about why you might want to share your Conda environments with others. How would you do that? Um, we're going to show that kind of as an aside about how to create a, a custom kernel for a Conda environment inside of Jupyter Lab. Um, this is really useful. Um, if you want to take advantage of the IT Research Computing's Jupyter Hub um, um, cluster that they have, uh, you can, you'll need to know how to create kernels for your Conda environment so that you can access notebooks and IPython consoles inside of the Jupyter Lab that's running in the, their Jupyter Hub. Um, and when we talk about sharing uh, Conda environments, what we're really going to mean is sharing uh, a text file that specifies the, uh, the contents of a Conda environment. And that's going to be an environment file. And so we're going to show you how to create environment files and talk about, uh, about how to use them effectively. And um, I use, I create all of my environments from environment files. Um, and I'll talk about some of the advantages of that, uh, of that approach momentarily. Okay, um, so working with environment files. So um, one of the things that you are almost certainly have encountered in your own work, um, if you have, if you collaborate on a research project, is that 
you're going to have different computing systems than your colleagues. Some of you are going to run Windows, some of you are going to run Mac, some of you might even run Linux. Um, some of you might not have access to a local computer at all, might entirely do all of your work on a remote cluster uh, like IVAX, but then you have collaborators who work on Windows and, and want to be able to run at least some of the code on their own machines. So you, if you're going to do that, then you need to have a way to make sure everybody has the same software installed um, for that project on their different machines. And forget about trying to, trying to get that to work if you're not using a tool like Conda to manage the complexity of environment isolation and package management. Um, but if you are using Conda, then you might still wonder, well, okay, that's great. You know, I've got my Conda environment on, on my machine, but how do I like, how do I give my Conda environment to my colleague? Or how do I put my Conda environment on, onto a remote cluster like IVEX? Do I have to like do some um, you know, copying of a directory to a thumb drive and then like put the thumb drive in my colleague's computer and then upload it, like or you know, copy it over you know over the internet from my machine to a remote machine like IVEX, like what do I what do I do? Um, and so we're gonna I'm gonna show you how to solve that that problem here. And the way that you're gonna solve it is by creating an environment file, which is just gonna be a particularly formatted text file that explains declares the dependencies that you want to install um, in your environment and where possibly also where Conda should look to download those packages. And then once you have that file, then you can share that file with whomever you need to share the file with. And as long as they have Conda installed in their system, they can run a particular command that we're going to talk about to create a Conda environment from that environment.yaml file. And that's really powerful. So an environment.yaml file is, um, or a dot .yaml file rather, is, um, I think I have something about that here, is, is um, the particular kind of structured text uh, format that is used to specify environment files in Conda. So YAML is short for uh, YAML a markup language, but it's basically um, a, human readable and but it's supposed to be easy enough to kind of write and read um, as a human but structured enough that um, there are sufficient rules that a machine can parse it efficiently and it's a very popular kind of uh, text format for all sorts of configuration files um, you know if you're using uh, you know docker or kubernetes or any of these uh, many you know web uh, web technologies use YAML as a configuration file. Um, so here's a, an example um, of a uh, of a uh, environment.yaml file. So we have a name. The first line is always a name. It could be an actual name that you want to have for the environment, or if you're going to install via prefix, then you can just put null as the name, like I have in the second example. And then you have dependencies, and then you just list your dependencies. And YAML is white space sensitive, so it doesn't matter how many spaces there are, but the consistency matters. So I think there's two spaces here, and two is not a magic number. Again, it could be three, it could be four, it could be 12, but what is, does matter is the consistency. So there's you know, two on every line. Um, you don't have to list version numbers, and if you don't list version numbers, just like if you had written the conda create uh, command uh, in the terminal and ran that command, um, conda will find the most, the newest mutually consistent set of uh, version numbers that can install and will install those. Or alternatively, you could list out explicitly version numbers that you want um, in your environment.yaml file. Um, so let's, um, so at the bottom here is the kind of the, the syntax for creating a, a Conda environment from an environment.yaml file. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I am going to copy, I'll just copy this one. And I will go into introduction to Conda. And now I will, um, 
I'll click here, just kind of do this manually, and then do call this um, other project dir enter. And then inside my other project dir, I will create a new text file. And I'll just paste my environment.yaml file in there. And then I'll go over here and you can do right click, uh, rename, and I will call this environment.yaml. And you can call this whatever you want. Uh, I always call it my environment files environment.yaml, uh, uh, which is the default because I found there's no real reason to rename it. Um, you'll notice that you know, JupyterLab understands YAML and has nice syntax highlighting and things for, for YAML. Um, and then once we have that file, um, we have to navigate to the directory where we created that, um, that environment.yaml file. So I will go, PWD will tell me where I am. LS will tell me what is in the current directory. So I will go to introduction to Conda and then other project directory. And then if I do LS, so there's my environment.yaml file. And then the command um, Conda env this time create. And we're going to create. And I'm going to do a multi-line command here. We're going to create via prefix. So I'm going to create an environment in the um, directory env inside this other project dir. And then the name, since I use the default environment.yaml name, this dash dash name is, is a bit redundant. Um, so I won't, uh, but I'll just type it here. If you, if you call this environment.yaml something else, then you would have to explicitly pass dash dash name and then whatever your name of your environment was, the environment.yaml file. Um, and then I believe that's it. Is there anything else? Yep, that's it. Okay, and at this point, I hit enter. And I have, what have I done? Uh, ah, huh. um, it's not name. I thought something was a bit wonky. It's file. Yeah. Okay. Now, at this point, Conda is doing the exact same thing that it did had I typed Conda create at the command line. It has an extra step where it has to parse the environment.yaml file to figure out the dependencies that you would like to install. Um, but once that is done, it's going to go through the same machinery. It's going to run off to find the metadata servers, um, to find the information about the packages that you want to install that were listed as dependencies. It's going to find all the dependencies of those packages, find the most recent set of versions um, that are mutually compatible, and then download and install them. And this step, if you have a really big environment, this solving the environment can actually take a little bit. And the reason is that um, it's Conda sets up what's called a satisfiability problem or SAT problem um, and basically sets all of these constraints about that are implied by the um, version numbers for the packages and then finds a solution to that mathematical problem. And that's how it, Conda can provide guarantees that the software that you're installing, as long as the solution has been found, is indeed uh, compatible and will work. Okay. Um, right, so that's done. So there we go. Um, and so now if I do, um, if I did a conda list, prefix env. 
So this will list everything that is installed in that environment. And there's quite a lot there, but if we compare, it went and installed IPython. So we know IPython will be in here somewhere. Uh, here's IPython. And then matplotlib, pandas. So here's matplotlib, pandas, pip, and Python. And then everything else that's here was a, a required dependency and, and scikit-learn. Everything else there was a required dependency of the packages that were listed here. Okay. And then of course we can activate it in the same way. So we can do conda activate env env dot slash env. Um, and then once we are in the active environment, we could just run conda list if we wanted to list out all of the things that are installed in that in that environment. Okay. So that, um, this is the command that I run all the time. This uh, conda env create prefix, it's this command over and over and over again. Every in conda environment I create is the, I run the exact same command. And it's because I always create my conda environments in the subdirectory in my project directory, and I always create them from an environment.yaml file. And it's a habit that I've gotten into, and it's really been uh, beneficial for me, um, both in my own work, because I always have this environment.yaml file, which completely specifies my software stack, but it's also made my work more reproducible and more portable. It's been, it's more reproducible because I can give that environment file to my research colleagues or peers or PIs that I work with, um, and uh, they can recreate the software stack on their own machine and rerun my own code um, to kind of to check what I'm doing or to reproduce my work. It's also more portable because if I want to basically share this conda environment that I've created um, on Binder Hub, where I might be prototyping a project, if I want to take that environment to, uh, to IBEX, all I have to do is copy this environment.yaml file over to IBEX and then rerun this conda environment create statement on IBEX and I'll get you know, the, the same environment on IBEX. And you know, I'll be, uh, be ready to go. Um, okay, so this environment.yaml file, which you write from, which I rewrote from, from scratch, was relatively simple and led to quite a lot of software being installed beyond what was actually listed here. So there is a command um, uh, called conda env export, um, and which will create an environment.yaml file from an active conda environment. And so that's this command here. So what we can do is we can run, whoops, sorry. So we can run conda env export um, prefix. Uh, actually, let me remind myself of, export given environment. Right, okay. So we can do uh, prefix env and file uh, exported in environment.yaml. I think that'll work. Yeah. So now if we look at this environment.yaml, so this has created a more, um, a much more specific um, environment.yaml file than this one. So this is the one that we wrote from hand, which then we use to create the environment. 
And then this one includes every package that was installed into the environment. So here's matplotlib. Here's the version number of matplotlib. And this is actually the build number over here. So this is very specific, constrains um, the major, minor, and patch number. So these are major, minor, um, so three is the major dot three minor dot two patch. And then the build number in this case was zero, but some of the other build numbers are, are quite specific. So here's the build number for IPython is, is quite elaborate. Um, but this is a very, very, very specific operating system specific set of packages that constitute this environment. And because this is running on, on Binder, it's running in a Linux environment. So you could probably take this very, very specific environment.yaml file to Ibex, which is another Linux environment, and recreate a working environment from this um, environment.yaml file uh, using uh, this same command here. Um, of course, you might have to change the name to exported environment.yaml um, here if you didn't rename the file. Um, but this would not work. This environment.yaml file would not work on Windows or Mac because it's so specific in the particular version numbers and the build numbers. And the build numbers in particular are operating system specific. So if you want to share an environment with your peers, I suggest, and this is what I do, is I write my own um, um, environment.yaml files like this. I typically would put version numbers in here. And then that's the environment.yaml file that I share around. And then I allow Conda the freedom to build that environment um, for a specific operating system when somebody runs the Conda env create command on their machine. So this is pretty important. So if you guys have any questions about this process or um, or how it works, it would be a good idea to ask them now. Um, you're going to get some practice in doing this um, in some um, in the next exercise. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions in chat, um, and nobody is unmuting themselves to ask a question. Yeah. Okay, well, let's see how, how well you, you guys uh, understand what's going on then. So let's take a, a, a three minute break and have a go at this exercise, creating a new environment from an environment.yaml file. So here's your environment.yaml file, has a, um, um, a new package that we've not talked about, xgboost. Um, see if you can, uh, create this environment.yaml file. Hopefully these version, these version numbers should be, should work, but you know, maybe you might want to try it without the version numbers just first to see kind of what versions Conda is able to find and install. So see if you can create this um, environment.yaml file. And then see if you can, from that environment.yaml file, see if you can create a Conda environment. And I will stop sharing momentarily. And you guys can ask questions uh, if you have any, any questions. I'll take a look at Gitter. You guys are a quiet group today, not too many questions. So I'm looking in the list of participants. I recognize some of the names that I work with you guys uh, and um, 
on tickets on Ibex and things like that. So I know some of you are are Conda users on Ibex. So you know, if you have some questions, now might be a good time to ask them while you have my attention, and I will do my best to either answer them. Um, they're not too far off off piece. Okay, well, if there aren't going to be any more questions, then I'm going to just kind of move, move on along. So I'll start sharing my screen again. Okay. Um, so let's see how to create um, an XGBoost environment. So I'm going to go through the whole Again, so I'm going to create a project directory. I'll call this um, XGBoost project there. And then inside of XGBoost, I will create a new text file. We'll paste my environment file in here. I'm actually just going to delete these, uh, these version numbers. And, and then in passing, since I want to sh I'll show you an example of this. Um, so once we've installed pip, we can actually put um, uh, pip dependencies in the environment file too. So here's how you would install that package combo that we, um, we talked about and manually installed using pip install. I'll just put it in here. Um, and then I'll let uh, and I'll let Conda kind of pick up the version numbers that it wants for all of these things. Okay, so then I will uh, rename this environment.yaml. And then um, I need to do some housekeeping over here. So I want to clear this out, clear out my terminal. And I want to run the conda deactivate command to deactivate my environment. And then I need to do a change directory. I need to go up one level. Uh, and then cd into the xgboost directory. And now I can run the conda environment create prefix. EMV file environment.yaml. Enter. And so now this is going to run off and um, download everything that's in that environment. While it's doing that, um, XGBoost. So XGBoost is a, uh, a fantastic library for, um, uh, for using a class of machine learning models called gradient boosted, uh, gradient boosting, basically. Um, there is gradient boosted trees and gradient boosted machines. It's um, very parallelizable. So it scales well to as many cores on a single node as you have. 
And it can also be made to scale across nodes uh, using all sorts of things. Dask is very, uh, very commonly used for this. It also integrates with Spark and, and other distributed computing frameworks. But Dask is the one that I think is probably uh, most widely used in conjunction with XGBoost. Um, it's super effective. Um, you can use it for both classification and regression machine learning problems. Um, it is widely used in, in Kaggle competitions of all, uh, in kind of all areas of application. It's probably the place where I would start as my default for any kind of machine learning problem that I needed to attack. Um, you can accelerate, uh, accelerate with GPUs, um, integrates nicely with scikit-learn and, uh, and pandas. So it's a fantastic library that you should be aware of. Um, and OK, so let's just kind of go through here and look. So um, it downloaded XGBoost. Um, and, and then here is the logs from pip. So when um, pip was run, this was the command. So it ran this Python pip install, and then, um, and then it installed combo. And so here is installing combo, and it detects, because uh, you're using the pip from within the conda environment, that pip is aware of what's already been installed in that conda environment. So it skips a lot of stuff that it doesn't need that's already been installed. And then down here, it needs to install a combo and these other two things. Um, and then also number, these other things that we installed earlier. So that's just a nice example of XGBoost um, and also how to use pip within an environment uh, .yaml file. OK. Um, so updating an environment. So there's a couple of ways that you can update an environment. Um, so there's a command here, so conda env update. It has a, basically the same structure as the, as the create command, um, except you use update. Um, and there's a dash dash prune, which will remove packages and dependencies from an, uh, an updated environment where you've kind of deleted packages. So if you don't put the prune command, then conda won't necessarily remove stuff that is no longer needed. But if you do put the prune, uh, or not command, the prune option, um, it will, conda will remove dependencies that are no longer required. Personally, I typically use this command to rebuild a conda environment from scratch. And that's because it's basically the same as the create command. You just, tap, you just toss this dash dash force um, option on the end of the command. And then it will basically remove the conda environment and then just recreate it from scratch. And given that conda does so much caching and things of packages anyway, there's not much additional overhead from running this command and just blowing away the environment and recreating it from scratch again. So I just prefer doing that. Um, um, so as an example, so if we wanted to add Dask to the XGBoost environment, what we could do is we could go back to our environment.yaml, stick in Dask, save it, and then just run the same command, but with force on the end. And uh, note over here that environment directory has now been deleted. So conda ran a conda uh, remove command behind the scenes, completely removed that environment, and is now recreating it from scratch. And there is you know, a little bit of additional overhead associated with this process. Um, but um, I don't think it, it's really too much of it, or I haven't found it to be too much overhead in my own work, let's put it that way. And the benefit is that it's the same command. Um, and you can automate the creation of these environments with bash scripts much more easily. Um, and there's something, there, there's something nice about being able to burn down your entire software stack and then just recreate it when, when you need to. 
like there's great power in that because you never have to worry about um, you know corrupting your environment. If you break your environment and you're using kind of the 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 best practices that I'm advocating here, using environment files, using the con invade environment create this command here basically, then if you corrupt your environment for whatever reason, yeah, okay, fine. You know, you can just remove the environment and rerun this command and start over from scratch. <clears throat> okay, and let's see if this is done yet. So this seems to be taking longer than I would have expected, but, um, oh, here we go. Now it's actually executing things. It shouldn't really have to download too much because, if anything, because we've installed so many of these same packages over and over that most everything should be cached. And there we go, we're done. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the last topic before we're going to switch over to doing uh, GPU dependencies is um, how to make Jupyter aware of your conda environments. Um, so before I talk about that, though, again, I want to give you another opportunity to ask questions about, um, about these environment files and how you can use them uh, in your own work. Does anybody, any questions about these environment files? How many people have used an environment file before today? Hi, David. I do have a question. Yes. So uh, I have seen some uh, JAML files for environments that specify the channels. Is yes. this worth it or is this it's just a precaution? Good question. Um, so the channels, the, the details of the channels discussion um, is in the, uh, the next episode, um, but I'm actually going to skip it and go to the GPU section because I think that that's going to be more important uh, for the target audience. Um, I do always specify channels um, in my uh, Conda environments. The two that I specify, that I always, um, let me share my screen again. Um, the two that I, I like to specify um, are the ones that we're already getting by default in the binder hub. But typically, if you were running this on your local machine, what you would see is this would be the effective default that you would get. And this defaults channel is basically pulling from the um, the official maintained Conda channels that are, are maintained by the company Anaconda um, who developed a, the Anaconda bit distribution and open source a lot of the software um, around it. And um, so they maintain for the community this repository of default channels that um, you will pull from. Um, I typically we'll add uh, Conda Forge. And we'll see some examples of this in the GPU episode that we're gonna talk about next because Conda Forge is where most of the GPU dependencies uh, or packages live on that channel, on the Conda Forge channel, um, or at least some of them. And so here, by listing their channels, what you're actually saying is that first, Conda should look to download packages from Conda Forge and only if it doesn't find it on Conda Forge will it then look in the defaults channels. And so you get this prior, this hand-picked priority of, of channels. Um, another common one that we'll see in a minute um, is PyTorch. So PyTorch has its own channel. Um, so if you're downloading things from PyTorch, then you would put PyTorch as the first channel, then Conda Forge, and then defaults. So I do specify my channels. But pretty much, I only do this unless I have unless I'm doing something more like PyTorch or or NVIDIA Rapids or some other frameworks that have their own channels. Thank you. Yeah, that's my question. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions? Check. 
attack. No. Okay. All right. Well, then I will um, I'll move on to the next section about making your conda environment, your <clears throat> making Jupiter aware of your conda environments. Let me just share my screen again. Okay. Um, so we've been creating a lot of conda environments uh, today. And you know, if we want to look at the conda environments that we've created, you know, we've created all of these these three project conda environments, and then we've got these other conda environments. But if we were go back here to JupyterLab, um, you know, we have notebooks and IPython consoles that, um, you know, are these attached to any of the conda environments they created? You know, no. Um, if we, so the, I mean, the answer is no, they're not. They're attached to the notebook environment. So for example, if we were to go in here and we were to say conda env, um, or sorry, conda list name notebook. So let's look through here. Um, okay. So pandas is installed in here. Um, Scikit-learn is not installed in here. So just as an example, so Scikit-learn is yeah not installed in the notebook environment, but we have installed Scikit-learn quite a lot. Pretty much every other environment we installed Scikit-learn. So if you were to launch an IPython console. Um, and try to do something like um, import. Uh, um, so from uh, SK learn import model selection. So this is like a, a module that's in selection. Yeah. So we get a module not found error because scikit-learn is not installed in this environment. So if we want to use our conda environments from within Jupyter Lab, then how can we um, how can we make it so that we can run um, you know, notebooks and Python consoles from one of these conda environments that we created? So that's what I'm going to show you how to do now. Um, so the first thing we need to do is we need to install this package called ipykernel. So ipykernel is just a little package that exists specifically to create Jupyter kernels um, for, um, for virtual environments, conda environments or pip, pip env, uh, pyenv, virtual env, whatever other virtual environments you have, ipykernel will do this. So we need to go to our uh, environment.yaml file and then add uh, ipy kernel as a dependency. So we'll save that. And then I'm going to go uh, and reinstall. So now I'm basically recreating the conda environment again. And we should see that it downloads ipy kernel um, once it realizes what version of IPy kernel will work uh, with the rest of the the rest of the dependencies, something else that will really speed up these solving environment times is actually providing the uh, the dependency version. Because if you remember what's going on, so behind the scenes, um, Conda is setting up this satisfiability problem, and if you prov the more constraints that you provide the easier that problem is to solve. So if you kind of leave it open-ended and you'll just say, well, you know, search through and find, you know, the most recent set of things that will work, then Conda has to do a lot of work. It has to find the most recent versions. It's got to solve a much more complicated uh, satisfiability problem than if you provide constraints. So I see that there are a couple of questions in chat. Um, or Oh, there they are. Yes, so I will provide the, the 
actually getting the name of the YouTube channel correct is one of the things that we're a bit stuck on uh, uh, right now. It sounds silly, but uh, we're working on it. Uh, we will provide it. Um, you will get an email about a, uh, a feedback survey um, tomorrow. And that, feed, that email should also contain a link to our YouTube channel. And these recordings, if they're not uploaded by tomorrow, will be made available on that YouTube channel. So, and we'll plaster all around social media on Twitter and everything like that. So um, don't worry, we'll make you aware of the, the location of the recordings. Okay, um, so let's go in here and look. So here's iPyKernel. IPy yeah, so it installed some dependencies of iPyKernel to allow you know, communication with Jupyter and whatnot. Okay, so then once we've done that, then we need to activate the environment. So we'll do conda activate um, env. And now if we run conda list, we can scroll through here and find, yep, here's ipy kernel. Okay. So now that's installed. So I'm just going to run the clear command to kind of clear this up a little bit. Um, and then I'll go back and look at my notes. So the command that we want to run is this command here. So I'm just going to uh, copy it. Um, I'll paste it here. So we're going to use Python. And now this Python is the Python from within the active environment to run this IPy kernel module. And we pass it this install command. And then this dash dash user is just um, installing in this kernel of for, this, for, for the user who's running this command, basically. Um, and then the dash dash name. So this is like a kind of like a conda environment name. Um, uh, you can use it to refer to your kernel spec files internally. So I'll just do, like if you wanted to remove this kernel spec later, um, you can refer to the, the kernel by uh, this name that you put in here. So I usually just put a dash kernel at the end of whatever my conda environment name is. And that's what I use for that. Um, um, that name. And then this display name is uh, what you will actually see in the Jupyter Hub or in the Jupyter Lab launcher window. So we'll call this XG Boost is awesome. Okay. And now we'll hit enter. And then so this tells you it installed this kernel spec file called this, and then this is where it put it. This would be in your home directory if you run this on IBEX or something, as an example. OK. So now if we go back to the launcher window, and maybe we need to refresh um, JupyterLab a little bit. Refresh the whole. There we go. So once you refresh uh, Jupyter Lab, then you'll get this this kernel. And so now, if we were to do, um, let's go back here. Uh, I'm just go. So if we were to go in and launch a notebook. And now if we were to import, so import uh, xgboost as xgb, and then we hit shift enter. And there we go, uh, xgb. So we've imported uh, xgb now. And so now you can see that it's there. And you can get tab completion to see kind of all the stuff that is in XGBoost. So that now we've linked um, our conda environment that we created so that we can launch notebooks and 
uh, IPython consoles from that uh, from that conduct form. Um, right. Uh, okay. So any questions about that? I know it's a little bit of a kind of like uh, technical hand wavy process on how to do that, but it is really useful. So the uh, IT research computing has a, a nice Jupyter Hub instance um, that is deployed on top of Kubernetes and you can run Jupyter Lab um, and have kind of a base Jupyter Lab setup on their Jupyter Hub. Um, but then if you want to create extra conda environments from within um, Jupyter Lab, like we've been doing in this, just like we've been doing in this workshop, you will need to understand this kind of process of creating these Jupyter kernels um, so that you can run notebooks and, um, and IPython kernels from the Jupyter or from the conda environments that you've been creating. So any questions about that before we move on to GPU things? All right, uh, me again. So just to be clear, we can take uh, different kernels for different environments in the same Jupyter hub. Correct. Okay, excellent, thank you. Yep, and we could do this exact same sequence of commands. You could do, um, I don't have any other environments to, to do this with, I don't think on my, my new, and because I had to refresh my, my Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Lab instance. But if you had machine learning in or basic SciPy in, um, you could run, you could activate those environments and run this command. You might have to go back and check whether IPy kernel was installed. And if it wasn't, you'd have to, re, you'd have to install it and re, install it in the environment. Um, but then you could create kernels, as many of these kernels as you want. Okay. Um, okay, so just to wrap up, so even though we covered a lot of like the core commands on how to use Conda in the previous episode, the workflow of creating Conda environments from environment.yaml files and um, then linking those Conda environments via Jupyter kernels to an existing JupyterLab installation is kind of the best practice workflow that I follow quite a bit in my own work. Um, so there's a lot of, even though this episode was, a, was shorter in some sense, there's a lot of, of more higher level conceptual content that's important in this episode. So you know, take the time to kind of go over it carefully and make sure you understand how the pieces fit together. Okay, so moving on. So this is the episode that I, I'm gonna skip um, it covers the details of, of packages and channels, goes into a little more about the structure of packages, talks about what conda channels are. The short uh, version is that there are URLs where conda looks to download packages. Um, and the order in which you list the channels in your environment file is the priority in which conda should search through those channels to find packages. Um, but all of that is written out in a longer form form here, including how to use conda install commands to specify particular channels and, and things like that. Um, but I'm going to kind of just jump over this and, and end the day with a discussion of GPU dependencies. Okay. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I stressed um, at the very beginning was that uh, Conda, one of the reasons Conda is very useful is that it can manage dependencies for things that are not just Python packages. And here is going to be a prime example of that that's very relevant for um, people who are doing data science and scientific computing um, uh, research managing NVIDIA CUDA libraries. So prior to um, these libraries being made available from NVIDIA, directly by NVIDIA on their own channel and on the default uh, Conda channels, you had to manually like sign up for the NVIDIA developer program, you had to manually download the binaries, you had to put them in the right place on your system. Uh, some of this stuff could be installed with um, Linux 
uh, OS package managers like apt or, or yum, but you have to have admin permissions in order to uh, install those things. Um, you could also get these libraries via, via Docker, but then you have to you know, understand and know how to use Docker. And so you know, needing admin rights means that uh, you are dependent on the, uh, the system admin team to install all of your NVIDIA stuff on, uh, on for example, like the IBEX cluster, um, or because they have to be in, in that situation, they'd be installed using the OS system uh, package managers, or you have to use uh, containers, which have a bit significantly steeper learning curve than a tool like Conda. So Conda for me sits in this like happy middle ground. It allows you to install things in user space, which means that you can quickly install whatever you want. Um, and um, don't run into permissions issues. And it manages things that typically had only been manageable via OS system or OS level package managers like NVIDIA libraries. So let's learn how to do some stuff with NVIDIA libraries. Uh, this is a mess. I'm going to clear this and deactivate. Okay. Um, now, one thing we're not going to be able to do is actually run stuff on GPUs because on the, uh, at least for the public binder hub, the public binder hub does not have any GPU support. So we can install the CUDA libraries, but without the drivers and the physical hardware underneath the, um, the instances on which we're running, we won't be able to actually like do anything with the GPU. Um, now, I believe um, there are plans for the IT research computing to have some degree of uh, GPUs um, available um, on their Kubernetes cluster at some point. Um, but if you have questions about that, you'll have to reach out to the research, IT research computing to confirm specifics. Okay. Um, so what do I want to do? So I guess I just want to show what, how to find out kind of what CUDA things are available. And, and then we will build some uh, environments with, I'm going to get caught up on my, um, my teaching notes. There we go. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of GPU specific software to, to keep up with. Um, you've got, uh, you know, your NVIDIA CUDA toolkit, which is kind of like the base um, on which all of the CUDA software ecosystem is built. So you've got to have a version of the CUDA toolkit. There's the NVIDIA collective communications library called Nickel, um, which is useful if you want to do multiple GPU. Uh, Training it accelerates significantly accelerates communication between GPUs. Then, if you're doing deep learning, there is QDNN, which is the NVIDIA uh, Deep Neural Network Library, which is a set of uh, GPU accelerated linear algebra routines, um, specifically targeting uh, deep neural networks. Um, so you can go to the NVIDIA developer website. You can find all the documentation. You can find instructions on how to install this stuff. Uh, uh, on your system, um, but it's it's complicated and there's a lot to learn. And so one of the a major takeaway that I want to get across in this episode is that Conda, you know, dispenses with a lot of that complexity and allows you to simply manage the NVIDIA dependencies as if there are any other package that you can install via Conda. So let's take a look at what's actually available. Um, so if we do uh, conda search, whoop, search uh, CUDA toolkit, and um, we'll see what comes up. OK. So we have um, the CUDA 9, 9 2, 10.0, two versions of 10.1, two different builds of 
10.2, um, and then even a build of CUDA 11. So the CUDA toolkit, many versions of CUDA toolkit uh, available. Um, and let's, let's see what else we can find. So I mentioned that, um, so remember we can do wildcard searching. So if we stick a, see what happens if we stick a star on the end of CUDA toolkit, see if there's any other um, CUDA toolkit related things. Indeed, so here's a CUDA toolkit dev and almost the same versions. We've got some 9.2s, 10.0s, and different builds of 10.1, but no CUDA 11. So the difference between CUDA Toolkit and CUDA Toolkit Dev, um, in addition to CUDA Toolkit Dev only being available via the Conda Forge channel and not the defaults channel, is that the CUDA Toolkit Dev contains all of the, um, like the full blown installation of the CUDA toolkit, including the NBCC compiler and including any other development uh, libraries that are required for doing um, low level CUDA development and compiling CUDA extensions um, with NBCC. So if you are using a, if you want to have a Conda environment that installs, um, Python packages that have CUDA accelerated extensions. And this happens a lot. There's a big PyTorch ecosystem um, that builds packages that have PyTorch uh, extensions that require GPU acceleration. They need to be compiled. So you need the NBCC compiler for that, in which case you need the CUDA toolkit dev uh, package and the right version and possibly the right build number. But if you just want to use PyTorch or TensorFlow or NVIDIA Rapids or other GPU uh, accelerated software that does not require you to compile, you've not personally written any custom extensions that need compiling, and, you've not, um, and you're not using any packages that have extensions that need compiling, then you can just use the regular CUDA toolkit. And you don't need the CUDA toolkit um, dash dev version. Um, so that was one thing that I wanted to mention. The other is that if you look at um, NVIDIA, NVIDIA has their own channel. So you can put a dash C um, or dash dash channel um, to specify an additional channel to be searched. And what you'll see is that um, there might be some other versions of the CUDA toolkit that are available from NVIDIA beyond what is available in the, the default Conda channel. So there's, this looks like a, an earlier version of CUDA 11. Um, my own experience is that it's best to use the most recent build, the most recent patch of the, um, CUDA toolkit version. So for example, for 10.1, which is probably the most widely used version of CUDA, I would always use 10.1.243 and not this one, for example. And similarly, um, I would not use that. Um, would use 11.0.221. Okay. So that's how you can see which kind of versions of CUDA uh, uh, toolkit are available. So I mentioned QDNN. So what about what about QDNN? Um, so let's let's take a look and see uh, is QDNN available? And yes, it is. So there are several versions of QDNN available. There might be even more versions available from the NVIDIA channel uh, if you wanted to take a look. Note that the the QDNN versions. They have a lot of repetitiveness in the actual version number, but the build numbers are all different. So Conda is, is obviously smart enough that if you ask for CUDA Toolkit 10.1, and then you ask for QDNN, well, if you don't specify a version number for QDNN, you're going to get this one. 
So CUDIN in 7.6.5 for built for CUDA 10.1. Alternatively, there's a CUDA uh, 7.6 and 7.6.4 uh, available for CUDA 10.1, but generally you're going to get this, you're going to want CUDA 7.6.5. That's what you'll get by default. Um, now what about nickel? So conda search uh, nickel. So lots of nickel versions available. Um, and again, these build numbers don't make it obvious which version of CUDA is um, you know, it's not obvious to us as a human, unfortunately, because these build numbers have not been chosen for humans to read. But Conda is smart enough to know exactly, basically, which of these builds of nickel 2.7.8 are required for your given version of CUDA, uh, CUDA toolkit. So it will handle all of that complexity for you. Okay. Um, so now what I want to do is let's actually show some examples, do some examples of these. Um, so PyTorch. So here is um, PyTorch. So let's, I'm going to create a new folder, call this PyTorch project dir. Clean up some of this mess. Let's go to that. Um, and Conda, PyTorch, and then we will create our environment.yaml file. Right click, rename, environment.yaml. I'm sorry, is there a question? Sorry, that my mistake. No, it's okay. Um, okay, so here's our um, our CUDA or PyTorch environment. So PyTorch has its own channel, and if you actually go and take a look at uh, PyTorch, uh, the conda is the preferred method for installing uh, installing PyTorch. So if you know Linux. Uh, um, and then if you look at the conda command, so they give you the conda install command as if you were installing this into um, an existing conda environment. But here we can just see, so they've got CUDA toolkit. Um, so depending on what version you want, from them the default version is 10.2. And then I think the newest version of PyTorch is 1.6. Um, so let's, Let's just change this around. So let's get rid of these guys. And we'll pin that and pin that. And this, I'm not sure what that is. So let's just, we'll save this. Um, and, and then we will do uh, conda environment create prefix env file, environment.yaml, and I'll put force just out of habit because it's the same command I run this over and over again. It won't do anything here because there's no uh, environment to remove. Now, one of the things about uh, PyTorch that you'll note, um, well, I'll come back to that in a minute after this is done installing. 
So here's torch vision. So notice, so here, um, I'll wait until the cursor has kind of moved out of the way. It's blacking over the um, an important uh, um, an important um, thing. Sorry. Come on. I don't so basically, this is installing MKL. And the reason it's doing that is because um, PyTorch, the CPU portions of PyTorch are compiled against um, Intel's math kernel libraries, and therefore take advantage of all the acceleration and um, speed enhancements um, of MKL. So you get, that's why MKL is being installed. Similarly with OpenMP, and so here's the CUDA toolkit. So it's downloading CUDA toolkit. And we'll see what else it installs. I feel like my internet connection has gotten quite a bit slower in the last 15 or 20 minutes. Maybe it's going faster for, hopefully it's going faster for, for you guys. Some of these are bigger downloads. The CUDA toolkit is a, you know, is a fairly sizable download. You know, see PyTorch is also a fairly sizable download in part because a lot of, a lot of things are, um, built directly into the PyTorch binary uh, itself, which is, so what I was going to tell you is that um, you're not going to see uh, QDNN and you're not going to see Nickel um, installed here. And that's because both QDNN and Nickel are actually um, built into the PyTorch binary itself. So you don't have to, and that was part of their decision was to try to simplify the software distribution process for PyTorch users by compiling and statically linking into the binary for PyTorch, QDNN, and Nickel. So you don't have to actually install those. But the result is that the PyTorch binary is quite large relative to uh, others. This is different than TensorFlow, where with TensorFlow, you do have to ask for QDNN and you do have to ask for Nickel if you want them. OK, so if you were to activate this, con activate um, env, and then we did a conda list, um, what you will see is, again, CUDA toolkit. But you don't see QDNN and you don't see Nickel. That's OK, because for PyTorch, and you can see it here, they don't list the nickel version, but it's in there. But this PyTorch is Python 3.8, CUDA 10.2, CUDNN 7.6. And also, nickel is included in there, but they don't list it in the build mode. OK. Um, so now, if we wanted to, um, if we wanted, we could do, let's practice our Jupyter kernel again. So um, if we go to our environment file, and I should have put that in here, IPy kernel. So I guess it's another, another thing to in, get used to installing uh, IPy kernel if you think you might want to create a Jupyter kernel for your environment, because um, then you won't have to uh, redo it. This should go a lot faster because uh, there's nothing, uh, nothing to download now. Um, but I'll go to, I'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, okay. 
Okay, so while that is going, so I'll just talk through some examples. So there's a, an exercise here to look at TensorFlow. Um, I will just talk through the solution with you in the interest of time. But here, um, we install CUDA Toolkit. We have to explicitly ask for a CUDNN. Um, CUPD is another NVIDIA dependency that is for profiling. Um, it's a low-level profiling tool. And then we ask for a specific version of Nickel, and then um, the GPU version of TensorFlow. Um, so that's an example. And also this MPI for Pi, which will download a uh, CUDA-aware OpenMPI implementation, um, which is useful if you want to do uh, distributed uh, multi-GPU training. Um, another example. Um, is NVIDIA Rapids, um, Blazing SQL, and, uh, and Data Shader. Um, so this is like, if you're used to doing work with scikit-learn, um, so the NVIDIA Rapids stack basically takes the scikit-learn stack and accelerates it with GPUs. And while trying to stay as close as possible to the scikit-learn API and the Pandas API and, and things like that, they have a whole um, stack of, of libraries that are about doing, I call it classical machine learning, so not deep learning, but classical machine learning um, on GPUs. Um, Blazing SQL allows you to write uh, SQL queries that are GPU accelerated, um, and Data Shader is a GPU uh, accelerated plotting library. Um, this ecosystem has seen a huge amount of growth in the past, uh, in the past year. Um, it's on version, I think, 16 now, um, and there's been three releases since June. Um, so it's seeing a lot of development. Integrates tightly with Dask, so you can scale not just to a single GPU or even multiple GPUs on one node, but multiple GPUs across multiple nodes. Um, a lot of really powerful stuff is going on in the NVIDIA Rapid space. And you, Conda is the preferred tool for installing uh, NVIDIA Rapids, and this is kind of a, a stub environment file to get you started with that. Um, and so let's go back and see. Right, okay, so we're done. Um, so now I want to run, uh, let's see if I can remember the command. So Python dash m ipy kernel install user name uh, PyTorch EMV kernel. So that can be whatever I want, but I, I keep with the dash kernel uh, convention. And then um, the display name is uh, PyTorch, uh, I'll just call it PyTorch, and then hit enter. Okay, and then if we go back to our launcher window, and might have to wait a little bit. Um, I can speed this. There we go. So there's PyTorch. And if we were to open a, um, a notebook, we could do uh, M port uh, torch, and then we can do torch dot cuda dot is available, and we get false because again, on the hardware on which I'm running this Jupyter Lab, which is on Google's cloud, they don't have uh, the the Docker image does not include NVIDIA drivers, and there's no GPU hardware. Um, sitting behind this uh, this instance, so not yet, at least. But if you ran this on IBAX or someplace where there actually was was GPUs, then this would return uh, CUDA is available to be true. Um, right. Okay. Um, is there anything else that I wanted to mention about PyTorch? Um, 
One thing that's very important when you're using PyTorch that this PyTorch channel be given preference over Conda Forge. The reason for that is, um, you know, Py Conda Forge is a community channel that's maintained. Anybody can put stuff on Conda Forge. The official PyTorch development team distributes their official binaries of PyTorch via their own channel. People have put builds of PyTorch on Conda Forge. You probably don't want them. They're not like the official builds. It's just a build that somebody has decided to stick on Conda Forge. So please always make sure to put PyTorch as higher priority over Conda Forge if you're using these environment files uh, to manage your PyTorch projects. Um, okay. Okay, so I think the last thing that I want to mention is just uh, approaches to dealing with um, if you need the CUDA compiler. So I mentioned the CUDA toolkit dev package. So here's an example um, uh, environment.yaml file that uses PyTorch and um, uh, PyTorch cluster, which is an example of a of packages in the PyTorch ecosystem that have GPU dependencies that need to be compiled, or sorry, GPU extensions that need to be compiled. And so here's what it would look like. So here I use the CUDA toolkit dev to get the development version of the CUDA toolkit, which includes NVCC. And then I use the CXS, CXX compiler to get a C++ uh, and C compiler. Um, and then with those two compilers, then actually I can compile all of the, um, the, uh, the CUDA extensions that are included in PyTorch cluster and PyTorch geometric and Torch scatter and these other libraries. So this is an example of a, of a more complicated library, uh, complicated environment um, that um, I've worked with a lot of users who run into trouble um, trying to get this kind of software stack to work on IBEX. And this is the general template for doing that. You've got your environment.yaml file that includes the, NBC, the dev version of CUDA Toolkit and a, CXX, a C compiler, C++ compiler. And then you can put all of your, um, these extensions that need to be compiled um, into um, your requirements.txt, which is a way to install things via pip. And then you can do all of this. So you can do these things um, on IBEX and manage these software stacks yourself, but uh, you do have to invest the time to kind of learn the, the environment management uh, patterns and syntax via Conda. Um, and then there's an alternative approach, which, um, which you can use if for whatever reason, the CUDA toolkit dev version that you need is not available via Conda. You can use uh, a system install version of CUDA toolkit. Um, and then you can use this package that basically tricks your Conda environment into seeing the system install of, of CUDA. Um, it's a little bit more complicated even. Um, I have, I do use this approach to do my, build my Horvath environments for, um, for doing distributed uh, deep learning on IBEX. And this is basically from here for the rest of the notes, it's kind of a discussion of how to get that Horvath environment running. Um, and I'm not gonna go into it now because it's pretty late in the day for doing deep dive stuff like that. So. I'm gonna take the last 15 minutes um, and um, just answer any questions that you might have. I see there are a couple in, the, in Gitter and then there's at least one in the group chat. So I'm gonna take a look at the questions and then we'll just do kind of a Q&A for, for the rest of our time. So uh, we have on group chat so is there a way to know the necessary dependencies before starting installation for example in the case of tensorflow so um so kind of i mean you can go to so tensorflow install and see what they have for 
uh, TensorFlow 2. So Google typically only provides pip install commands and then Docker containers. They are a bit conda averse uh, for some reason. Um, and one of the ways, if you want to get started with, with TensorFlow, so I spent a good bit of time kind of answering this question. And I have put on the um, Calst uh, let's go. On the Calst Viz Lab uh, GitHub page, I've made these template projects. And I try to keep them reasonably up to date. Some of them need a refresh. Um, but for example, in the, the TensorFlow GPU, so I have an environment.yaml file that includes um, the kind of the set of dependencies that I have found that works, um, that has everything that I need and works the kind of best to try to help people get started. So there's one of these for TensorFlow. Um, there's one for NVIDIA Rapids. So here's TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, and Horovod. And you can use any of these to like use as a template and you can create this repository um, under your own GitHub account. And then you'll get a copy of everything in the folder um, or everything in the repository rather, sorry. And then you can go through and edit the environment.yaml or add pip install dependencies in the requirements.txt. And then I've got some instructions in here on how to actually use it um, and, and things like that. This one looks like it could use a refresh just from a quick glance. There's poor bug stuff in here, which is not, not common. Um, but I know the NVIDIA Rapids one, I just did a refresh of that uh, a couple of days ago. And so it has um, environment.yaml and, and similarly. Um, so a little bit of trial and error, I guess, is the answer to that question. Um, but also, you know, I've tried to um, encode as much of my knowledge on how to do these things effectively into these template repos on our GitHub page, um, which I will put uh, into the chat. Um, and I go through and refresh these at least once a quarter uh, to try to keep them up to date with the most recent versions and things to help people get started. Um, and one of the things I've thought about doing was actually making some little, little mini webinars on how to use these template projects to get started running these um, workflows on IBEX. Um, um, if that's something that you think would be of interest, then in the feedback form, you can uh, you can make me aware that you think that would be useful by just mentioning it. Um, all right, so let's see what questions. Uh, resolve package not found, XG boost. Um, let's try to see what's going on here. Hmm, interesting. So this is this must have been put up a while ago. Uh, so let me see. Um, let's go back to introduction to Conda XG Boost. So this this seemed to work. So okay. So. Basically, this worked for me, but when I tried it without uh, the version numbers. OK. Um, so OK, so any other questions? I'll stop sharing my screen briefly. 
So we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I mean, that was a lot, kind of a fire hose of information about Conda and some tips and tricks and very advanced use cases at the end. Um, these lesson materials are under a fairly active development. Um, I've given uh, tutorials using these materials at some major conferences this summer and have at least two more major conferences to deliver this tutorial at. Um, I'll be adding some sections on, um, on some notes on using Conda on HPC and systems. Um, so that I'll try to encode a lot of my experience of using Conda on IBEX and make it a bit more general targeting HPC users. Um, so there'll be another episode on that. Um, possibly some more, uh, you know, a refresh of the GPU uh, instructions, um, things like that. Um, you can always open issues on the um, on the page if there are other things that you find that are either errors or things that are unclear. You know, feedback is appreciated because I can fix them um, for the next iteration. Um, otherwise, if there are no questions, then I guess that's us done for the day. Um, thank you all very much, the 14 of you who hung around for the whole four hours. Um, I will hang around until the, the last person leaves if, if there are some shy people who have questions that uh, they don't want to ask in front of everybody else or uh, they can hang around. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. All right, bye guys. See you, uh, see you next time. You're most welcome. I will hang around if there are uh, if there are questions. Um, but if you don't have a question, it would be probably good for you to go ahead and leave. That way, I know that you don't have a question. Okay, last chance for questions. Okay, well, bye, everybody. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you next time.